Happy Friday. What do I have to say to you? I have to say uh, that it is time for some good old programming on the stream known as Large Data Bank. This week was pretty good. I want to say this week was pretty good. Um, I think that, was it Thanksgiving last week? I know I got dressed up. It's because I ran out of t-shirts. <laughs> it's because I ran out of t-shirts. <laughs> Imagine that. Oh my God. So Thanksgiving was last weekend. Thanksgiving was last weekend. Somehow it doesn't feel real to me, but, um, I just wanted to say that I'm thankful for some things. One of the things I'm thankful for is this stream. This stream has been a lot of fun for me over the past year and it's fun because of all of you. So thanks guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you all. Um, I was thinking during, I think during the week, somebody had a meeting and in the beginning of the meeting, they were like, um, so let's talk about what we've been thankful for. You know, it's an icebreaker. You know how sometimes people do those in their meetings. It's like, let's have an icebreaker, start things off. And so somebody was asking me what I was thankful for. And this wasn't really a real answer, but I was thinking that it would be pretty good to have a, like a, like a sort of observability Thanksgiving in a sense. Cause I was at that moment just thinking about, you know, incident management and like, what do you do when you have a problem with a piece of software or a database and what you're thankful for in those moments is observability, right? You're thankful for logs. You're thankful for alerting. You're thankful for metrics. Um, and you're, you know, you're thankful for being able to see what your uh, piece of software is doing. So I guess that was kind of stupid, but, um, I think that it would be good to have an observability Thanksgiving or like a, I don't know. There's lots of things we have to be thankful for when we're supporting production systems, right? I would say so. Um, yeah, so I don't know. What, what did I do this week besides make a stupid Thanksgiving joke? Um, it was pretty busy, to be honest. Felt like this week was kind of nonstop. I'm not sure what it's like for everybody else watching. Um, I feel like this tends to be a pretty busy time of year because everybody's kind of trying to wind down their years, right? We're entering the holiday season. There's like two weeks left and then it's lights out for a little while, right? So I feel like it was extra busy for me. <laughs> the calculator unboxings. Well, um, I told you that you could come to the stream to find out whether they were real or not. And I'm not quite ready to announce whether or not they're real. <laughs> so you'll just have to stick around for a little bit longer to find out the answer to that question. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Things are busy. Hopefully things get a little bit less busy. Hopefully we can, we can all chill a little bit as an industry. That'd be nice. Some chilling could be good. So what I kind of wanted to do today, um, was think a little bit about, we've been doing these allocation reductions for the last couple of streams, which has been fun, but I feel like I'm getting a little, a little tired of it. It's getting a little monotonous. So I was thinking of doing something a little different. Um, I wanted to look at decimals. Hey, empty layer. My alert join, volume is off. Join, join, join. There we go. Right to disk. Okay, so uh, thank you for the seven months MD layer. Really appreciate your support. Uh, welcome to the stream. We were just talking about what we were gonna do today. And the answer to that question is we're gonna be playing with arbitrary precision decimals uh, in Cockroach TV. It's gonna be super cool. We're gonna learn a lot. I think, and by we learning a lot, I also mean me learning a lot uh, because the truth is the sad truth is that I actually don't understand arbitrary precision decimals very well at all, <laughs> uh, which is sort of problematic from the perspective of trying to work on them. But I thought that we could kind of, you know, investigate some of this stuff together and, and uh, sort of see what's up there. So let me just give you the background, right? The background is that, um, oops, inside of databases, um, cockroach to be included, you can make a column that is a decimal column. So let's just do that as an example here. Actually, I'll make a, a table with a few different kinds of, of data inside. I'll make an integer primary key. We're so fond of those here. I'll make a an F float and a D decimal column. Whoops, I also have to give it a name. I'll call the 
the table A. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about what does it mean to have a decimal column as opposed to a float column? Um, uh, so if I, let me insert some data into this table. I'll insert into A values 1, 1.0, 1 1.0. 1 How about that? So if I select star from this table, um, it looks like I've basically got some ones in there. The float formats a little differently than the decimal. That's kind of interesting. But the point is that um, floats, as you might be aware, have sort of a limited precision to them. Um, they're a fixed size data type. And I think the float that I'm asking for here is probably a 64-bit float. I think we only support 64-bit floats in CockroachDB. Um, but that tends to be troublesome if you want to support um, you know, precise uh, mathematical operations. So if you wanted to add up a bunch of numbers, like you're doing money things, exactly. Well, money tends to be a little bit different, I would say. Um, <laughs> I think when people are doing real things with money, they don't even use decimals. I think they use integers and they, they represent things in, they're talking about like, you know, micro cents or something. They have like a very particular representation. Sometimes they even represent them in bytes um, because they want to do their own kind of math on them. They don't want to trust the database to do that. I've heard of this in, in real life from various sources. Uh, but yes, I think if you were doing sort of a naive representation of money, you would probably not want to use a float. You probably also wouldn't want to use an integer because that seems complicated, but you might want to use a decimal. So arbitrary precision decimals. Um, let me see what happens if I play around with this a little bit. Insert into A values. And I'm going to put two. And I'm going to put like a big old honking weird looking number like this maybe. And then I'll put the same thing in the third column, which is the decimal and see what happens. I actually haven't like played around with this that much. So I don't really, like I said, I'm a little bit of a novice at this stuff. So we're going to learn together. Um, so let's see, select star from A. What do we get? So this is pretty interesting. This is basically what I was hoping to show is that if I've inserted a value that's so high precision like this, you know, it's basically a ton of zeros and then a five, the floating point column doesn't preserve the precision, um, which is, you know, a thing. I think we expect that as programmers, we sort of are, we basically understand that floating point numbers have limitations. Um, but, you know, it's just, uh, it's kind of a fact of life. And not everybody necessarily knows this, especially if they're newer to things. It's like, why would a floating point number have these limitations? Well, well it does. But the thing is that this decimal, on the other hand, it, it does preserve the precision somehow. And the question is like, how does this exactly work? And what do we have to do under the hood to like make all of this stuff happen? High precision numbers could be used for Bitcoin or other infinitely divisible stuff. Could this cause any major problems for users in other countries where they use dot as we use comma? That is a good question, JJM. Yes, I think there is some like locality, localization stuff with numbers. To be honest, I haven't really thought about that. Um, I don't know how, because like presumably you would want to change your locale and changing the locale would change the representation of numbers to put commas and stuff instead of dots or flip that. I don't know how that works. I'm not sure if that works for us at all, to be honest. So how many zeros can you add? Is it arbitrarily many or not? That is a great question. Let's find out. So how many was this? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, I think the answer is basically arbitrarily many, but I think there might be a limit of like hundreds of digits or something. I'm just going to like fill the screen full of zeros and see what happens. Uh oh, is my stream dying? Is my stream dying is a question. I'm seeing red and OBS. Hopefully it doesn't totally die. Okay. The answer to the question of is my stream dying is yes. Okay. That's not good. Well, hopefully it'll recover here. Um, okay. So that was a lot of zeros. Let's, let's go further into the depth of zeros. What will happen if we put even more zeros? Hmm. Well, you know what's frustrating, you guys? Um, 
when your computer decides, how do you know when your computer is using Wi-Fi or Ethernet? <laughs> that is a frustrating thing for me. Um, I am connected to Ethernet, but my Wi-Fi is also on. And I'm like, don't use the Wi-Fi, please. Please use the Ethernet if you can, if you can help it. Anyway, hopefully that'll recover. It's all good. Um, I think basically, um, basically, we should figure out the answer to this question by looking at the code. I think that there is a limit of number of decimals, but I don't know what it is. And I think that it's so high that probably just playing around in the terminal, attempting to find it will take a really long time. Um, let me up my font size here for a second. Okay. Um, so let's see if I go to decimal.go, I think this is basically where we store all of the information about our decimal representation. Um, and basically we use this library that someone named Matt Gibson wrote. He used to work at Cockroach and he wrote this library specifically because at the time there wasn't another uh, arbitrary precision decimal library available in Go that was sufficiently accurate. Um, there were, I think this was in 2016, there were some libraries, but they weren't particularly good. Um, so he wrote one called APD and APD, it has a bunch of features that I don't understand. And I, I, okay. So let's see, I think that the way it works is that you specify these contexts and contexts are kind of the way that decimal numbers and decimal libraries typically do their arithmetic operations. You sort of have the actual physical representation of a decimal, but then alongside that res representation of a decimal, you have a context. And the context is, is it sort of informs the mathematical ops how to behave. Um, and I think what this is saying is that you can choose to either, you know, to use any of these sort of different precisions of math um, stuff. <laughs> it has a bunch of features that I don't understand. I feel that's in my soul, me IRL, yes. Um, and I think that this high precision context, so 2000 decimal digits is the one that's used by default, but I'm not completely sure. Well, judging by the number of times that it's referenced in the code, I'm fairly sure that this is sort of, we just use this everywhere. Um, so let's see. This is kind of hmm, the representation of our scalar arithmetic operators like division i think is done like this so I, I guess if you divide two decimal numbers it uses 2000 points of decimal precision something like that <laughs> anyway so the point is that like it's i think that the underlying representation is arbitrary and we limit it to some number of thousands because reasons that i don't really know everybody knows that relational databases don't <laughs> scale because they use joints joints joint joint joints and right to this. Yo, Jason, thank you so much for the six months of tier one. Uh, I really appreciate your support. And I think that this Computers stash over a has taken a lot more than a few weeks for me to grow because my rate of facial hair growth is kind of like microscopic to be perfectly honest, but I appreciate that you, uh, you called it stately. <laughs> Quarantine is a good time to experiment with, uh, facial hair styles is what I'll say about that. <laughs> Cause you can only be judged by the people who are watching you on the internet. <laughs> um, right. So let's, let's look at how these things are actually implemented under the hood. Why don't we? So that I can begin to understand it and also explain a couple of things that I do already understand. Um, so in this APD decimal package, Hey, thanks for the follow cyber whiskey, by the way, inside of this APD decimal package, um, it looks like decimal is represented by this pretty simple struct, uh, which has four fields to it. Um, it's got a form and now I think form is kind of a way to represent these out of band values. So another funny thing about decimals is that they've got all sorts of weird quirky behaviors. Like I can say select inf decimal, I believe. And this is a special infinity quantity. I can also ask for negative infinity, infinity. I believe I can also ask for negative zero and that's represented differently. Well, maybe it gets normalized, but in certain circumstances you can end up with a negative zero that has to be represented. 
There's also various kinds of NANDs. Um, so if I say select one decimal divided by zero decimal, what happens here? Do I get a NAND or do I, no, I get an error. I actually kind of forget how to, how to provoke this thing to give me a NAN, but I do believe that it's possible. Um, but anyway, so these, these forms are kind of a ways to signal these out of band um, types of numbers. So either it's an ordinary number, in which case it's finite or it's infinite. Um, and I guess we'll get to the negative infinity or it's two kinds of NANDs. And there's basically, I, this is another thing I don't completely understand, but I think that um, you can either have a NAND that signals, meaning that it errors during computation, or you can have a NAND that is sort of silent. Um, and a silent NAND, well, couldn't tell you exactly why you'd want the difference, but but it is part of sort of this arbitrary precision decimal spec that we implement. Um, so let's try infinity divided by infinity. Hey, Occupy Paul Street. Welcome to the stream. It's nice to see you. So let's divide infinity by infinity. Ah, very good. Thank you, XX to the big foe. <laughs> Appreciate it. High precision numbers could be used for Bitcoin or other, somebody probably, Bitcoin is not infinitely divisible, right? I did not say that, and nobody in fact said that, um, but right, there's Satoshis or something, right? There's some like microscopic uh, divisible quantity, the atom of Bitcoin. I wonder if there, are, are there any like, ledger based well i don't know anything about this stuff not gonna lie are there any um altcoin type things that are that don't have an atom are they <laughs> he says not knowing at all what he's talking about okay so infinity divided by minus infinity is nan minus infinity divided by minus infinity is nan i don't know about this signaling nan stuff but in any case i guess it's important to represent so what else do we have? We've got a negative bit. So this says, is the thing negative or not, I guess. And I suppose you, if if it's one of these special out of band things, you just say it's minus infinity if it's infinity. I guess probably negative doesn't affect these NAND things at all. And then we get into the meat of the whole situation here, decimals, which is that we represent them by an exponent and a coefficient. Um, and a coefficient is, I believe, vaguely what's called a mantissa, I think. I did a little bit of tiny amount of research here, and I think what this is, is essentially an, an arbitrary precision integer. So that's why it's represented as this big dot int thing, which is something that Go um, provides to us. So it's just sort of all of the decimal numbers in the decimal. In other words, if I had you know 1.00005, I would represent that as 100005. And then I would multiply it by this by 10 to the exponent in order to place the decimal point um, inside of the decimal number. So it's actually pretty straightforward, um, I would say. I think if I've if I've gotten all of this correct, and I think I do, like there's sort of this nice doc up here that says decimal is an arbitrary precision decimal. Its value is negative times. Um, so that's right, to to add in that negative bit or not. And then the coefficient times 10 to the exponent. So coefficient must be positive. I guess that's because the negative bit is the thing that actually influences the negativity or positivity of the entire number. And then, yeah, that's kind of all there is to it. So that's, yeah, I think it's pretty pretty straightforward. So what I wanted to look at today though, specifically, oh yeah, wait, we should actually go into what this coefficient thing is because this is important. Um, the coefficient is represented as a big dot int and let's look at what that does on the inside. An int represents a signed multi-precision integer the zero value for an int represents the value zero. Okay, whatever. Operations always take pointer arguments rather than int values, and each unique int value requires its own unique int star pointer. Um, okay, and the reason for that is that underneath, okay, so like how would you represent an arbitrary precision or like sort of an arbitrarily long integer if you were trying to program one? Um, there is no fixed size data type that can do that. Um, that's pretty straightforward because it can be arbitrarily long. So Underneath the hood somewhere, you've got to have a big list of something, and that list of something has to be dynamic. Um, and so that's what this NAT thing is. Um, this is deep in the, the Go standard library. And so a NAT, um, I guess it's supposed to stand for natural number or something. I'm not sure why it's called that. It's a slice of words. And a word is a single digit 
of a multi-precision unsigned integer. So uh, I'm not going to go into the implementation of this thing because I'm not sure how important it really is. But the point is that this inside of decimal, we have something that has a slice inside. And as we all know, when we have a Go program that has a slice of something, that slice has to be allocated on the stack. I mean, on the heap, <laughs> not on the stack. That's the whole point. Um, and because of this, there are some kind of troublesome properties that I would like to talk about. And I think the object of this stream is to potentially see if we can get rid of some of that. Um, if you kind of remember, like several, several months ago, I think probably towards the beginning part of this sort of stream as an entity, we talked a lot about the vectorized execution engine in CockroachDB. And what the vectorized execution engine is at its core um, is it's a different, it's a columnar representation of data um, for a SQL database. And let's see, where is the file that I want to look for here? Um, ultimately, what this means is that when we look at the representation of one of these columns in the vectorized engine, um, we store it as a slice of value. Um, so for example, if I had a column full of integers, I would store it like this in, in memory for operation in SQL land, all of the, you know, pluses or distincts or joins or whatever, they're all going to operate over this sort of very simple data type, which is a slice of int 64. So we're going to have like, you know, big batches of these things at once. In fact, maybe a thousand data elements inside of this column. And this is very good for, you know, a lot of things. A processor can efficiently iterate over all of the elements in this slice. It can efficiently sum them. It can efficiently look at all of them without having to, you know, let things escape from its sort of hot processor cache, right? You don't have to, if you just have a small slice, it can really live very close to where it has to, to get operated on. Um, now that brings me to decimals. Um, like we just talked about, um, decimals are not a very, they're not a kind of, um, primitive or scalar data type, right? They, they, they are a struct and the struct contains a pointer to the heap. <laughs> um, and so that is big, big trouble for the vectorized execution engine. And in general, anything that wants to operate efficiently over something that's memory local. Um, because if you think about what we have to do to operate over a column of decimals, maybe we just even wanted to compare all of the decimals in a column to zero, maybe something very, very simple. Like I'll actually just do a demo here in the terminal. I'll say, you know, explain select star from, uh, what did I call my table? A where D is equal to zero, right? So what do we have to do to do this is that we've got to do a full scan because there's no index on D. Um, and then we've got to do this filter. Um, and this filter, is um, if I, so if I run explain vec, it's going to show me the sort of vectorized ops that we're going to run to do this computation. So it, it delegates to this thing called cell eek decimal decimal const op, which I'll look at cell eek decimal decimal const op, which is a big generated function. Um, and the point though, is that deep inside of all this stuff, which I'm going on and on about, we have a loop. <laughs> um, we have a loop and the loop is right here. And it says, get me the ith decimal in this decimal column, right? And it says, this just says, you know, return to me this IDX decimal object from my decimal slice and then compare it against my const arg, which in this case is zero. Um, and <laughs> because decimals are kind of tricky to compare, I guess it's a little more complicated. We, you know, we jump to this function. We like check the forms like we were talking about. And then we end up calling comp on the decimal and the de this does all sorts of crap. But like, even if there was a bunch of instructions to run, it would be sort of fine as long as the decimal memory was sort of local um, to that column or slice. The trouble is that it's not. <laughs> hey, Vimpot, thanks for the follow. So the big trouble. By guessing is that ultimately when we get down here, we're comparing that coefficient that we were talking about, right? The sort of arbitrarily long slice of words that represents that sort of coefficient of the decimal, we end up having to jump into the heap, um, which could be anywhere in memory. It's not at all guaranteed that all of the sort of heap parts of those decimals are going to be next to each other. And in fact, likely they won't. Um, so 
if you think about it, every for each of these 1024 decimals in our slice of decimals, we have to jump somewhere else random in the heap, you know, pull out all of the arbitrarily long word slice or whatever, compare it and then jump back. And then we have to do that one, you know, every single time over 1024 times. And that's, that's really expensive. That, that, that's some of the most expensive things that we would have to do as an in memory algorithm is jump somewhere random in memory. Uh, we, we really want to stay cache local and decimals sort of destroy that. Okay. <laughs> so what can we do about it is sort of the next question. Um, and I think that what I was sort of hoping to try in this experiment, I'm not really sure how far I'll get. Well, we'll just have to see, cause I think it's going to be kind of tricky. What, what I sort of wanted to try is, is come up with a, another represent, representation of decimals that instead of being, um, storing a slice of things that contain heat pointers, I want to have it just be completely flat. So I actually just want to store, you know, essentially a slice of byte. Um, so maybe this would be decimals too. Um, or something like that. We've also got, um, so there's, there's a couple of other things to talk about, but fundamentally, this is the idea that we would want to store all of the decimal data, including the sort of variably length, big integers inside of this single flat byte slice in the hope that, uh, we would increase cache locality for these, these comparisons. Um, and that, that, that's kind of the dream. And so, oh yeah, wait, I think there's one other important thing to say, which is why do I even care about this? Like, why, why do I, why am I bothering to talk or like think about optimizing this? Um, and the reason is basically that decimals are like empirically, like extremely slow in Cocker CV compared to floats. Um, they, they're extremely costly, um, in benchmarks like TPCH. TPCH is sort of this standard benchmark that we like to run that to check analytics-y sort of query types. And if we load TPCH data, so let's take a look at the TPCH schema for a second. If we load TPCH using decimals and not floats, we get, I don't know, some kind of insane level of slowdown that I don't actually remember offhand, but uh, it's pretty bad. So like if all of these things here, if we change these to say decimal, things would be like significantly, significantly slower in a bad way. Does Golang have something like Rust's small vec where it only allocates for long arrays or maybe that doesn't help us here? Um, so it does not have something built in like that. There, so there's another related piece of information, which is that there exist other decimal libraries that are, um, now that, okay. So, so APD decimal, right? This is the thing that I've been talking about. Um, this was implemented in 2016 when the, there were really no other alternatives for correct, um, well-tested decimal libraries in go. Um, the big amazing thing that Matt did while he was working on this is he implemented the general decimal arithmetic spec, including its test suite. So th this, this is like the ultimate website, this like speleotrove thing. I don't know. It like looks super random, but this is actually the like core part of where anybody goes to learn about how to implement arbitrary precision decimals in like the world. Um, so what he did that was really great is he implemented all of the test suite for, from this website, um, in APD decimal. And because he did this, it turns out that like later, some people went back to their other go libraries that do arbitrary precision decimal in particular. Um, I wanted to talk about one called Eric Lagergren decimal. And so Eric Lagergren decimal is a library that existed before 2016, but it didn't have the tests back then. And so we were sort of scared of it. We thought that it might have correctness issues and we didn't use it, but because Matt did this work on APD decimal, the other people, including Eric went back and added those test suites to their library. So now, now like we're confident that this thing works. And the thing about this library, sorry, this is a big digression, but the thing about this library that's different from APD decimal to your point, Paul, is that it includes this field here, the, the, this compact field, um, which is really like good. And what it says is that compact is in use if the value fits into a UN64. Um, and basically what that means is that in many cases, uh, when, if you have a small enough decimal, it can fit into a stack allocated UN64 that lives inside the struct. You never have to allocate anything on the heap and you're all good to go. So it's like sort of a performance optimization that's actually very good. And I think separately from this project that I'm talking about, I would like to switch us 
to use decimal.big instead of apd.decimal because I do believe that this thing is now correct. And I also believe that it's much more performant. That being said, even if we did that, um, we would still end up having to somehow deal with this problem, I'm pretty sure, because as soon as you have fields that are, or like decimal values that are bigger than can fit into compact, you have to jump to the heap again, and then you're just back to kind of square one. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of an open question, I guess, but I do think that Okay, so there's one other piece to it. <laughs> there's one other important piece, which is that not only do we care about performance here, we also care about memory use um, and specifically tracking memory use and allocating memory in an efficient way for the database. Um, one thing that's really good about this representation that we switch to, this vectorized representation, is that to get a slice of these ints, you can sort of, they're all contiguously allocated and the lifetimes of all of these slices are very well known and simple. And eventually we could be pooling these slices into sort of standard database column chunks, right? And that's something that I really, really wanna to do to help our sort of memory use story. I think I talked a little bit about this on several streams recently, but Go's garbage collector, um, gives, you know, it's, it's, it's a good garbage collector, but it's definitely not foolproof. And I think, especially for an application that's so memory intensive, like a database, it can be sort of tricky to not run into sharp edges with the garbage collector. Um, specifically, yeah, there's like, sometimes the garbage collector reclaims memory a little bit slower than we want, hard to track the memory usage of the garbage collector or of, of the heap in general. So what we'd really like to do is make a big old pool of these slices and sort of pre-allocate them at the beginning of the program and use only those slices for SQL memory at all. So never allocate memory from the Go heap and only allocate, only sort of use these um, slices that we've pre-allocated at the start of the program. So that gives users a lot more control. They can say, you know, use exactly one gigabyte for SQL memory and we can guarantee that they'll never use more than what, that one gigabyte. So coming back to decimals, if we did, if we did that, it would be really tough to continue using data types that have heap pointers um, because, well, you would you still have to allocate those separately. So ideally we'd be able to allocate this, you know, decimal column chunks as their own things pre-allocated at the start of the program, just like everything else. So even if we switch to this better representation, which I'd like to anyway, for other reasons, I think we still sort of have to solve this problem. Um, so it, it's kind of a lot, right? There's a lot of elements to this. And to be perfectly honest, it's not clear to me what to do first. It's just sort of a big honking set of concerns. Um, and so I guess I thought that I could start with this flat bytes kind of representation because, mm, well, I think it's a step in the right direction, <laughs> I guess. There's gonna be problems in, in no matter what we do. Um, okay. Um, does that make sense? Does anybody have questions? Um, feel like, I feel like it's, it's kind of all these, these, um, elements kind of fit together in my head pretty well, but it's not exactly clear to me whether what I've been saying makes sense. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think, I think, okay. So, 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 so one other quick thing to talk about is flat bytes. Um, we have a representation of bytes arbitrary bytes columns. It's a little bit more complex than just byte slice because you need to be able to see inside of the byte slice, um, like the, the offsets essentially. Like if you have a variable length bunch of bytes, you've got to know where the variable length um, sort of elements start and begin or start and end. And so we use this uh, struct here to, to represent that stuff. We've got the big byte slice, we've got a slice of the offsets and then a couple of other sort of relevant things. This is my full-time job. Yeah, so my full-time job, I'm a manager. Um, and on Fridays, I try to program on stream to for fun and to get more people interested in CockerCB and to contribute too. So you're saying the memory for all the decimals should be managed together because if you try to manage it for each decimal individually, there is too much garbage collector overhead. Yeah, so I think that's a pretty decent summary. It's not just too much garbage collector overhead. It's also that we have a hard time limiting the amount of memory that we do allocate for those decimals. Um, yeah, in fact, we can't do so at all. 
because of the fact that decimals do take arbitrary amounts of memory and we don't track that anywhere. It would be pretty challenging to track that given the architecture of the decimal library that we use. <clears throat> so I think, I think the idea is that what we would want to do basically is instead of representing decimal as a decimal slice, we'll represent it as a, one of these flat bytes things. Um, and then on demand, and this is, this part is going to be a little bit questionable. I would say like probably the most questionable of all this is on demand. We're going to sort of suck up the bytes in the byte slice into a fully sort of realized apd.decimal or decimal.big, I'm not sure which, and do the operations on that. And then since we, since these kind of, um, in the vectorized engine, these like column slices are kind of immutable, um, instead of like editing them in place, which wouldn't really work anyway, we will we'll sort of move the result of the calculation to the new slice, something like that. It's going to be, it's going to be bad. It's going to be challenging because, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll just have to see like how it goes. Basically, how are we going to start doing this is a good question. I think what we should probably do is just start by changing this decimals type to be a star bytes and kind of see what explodes in our face over time. One thing that's kind of weird to me. Oh, do we just have like another? Yeah, we just have another file for bytes. Um, yeah. So we'll say now decimal is a flat slice of bytes that can be interpreted as fields of an apd.decimal. I don't know. This is I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work out uh, at all. <laughs> so the first thing that goes wrong, and ooh, this is pretty essential. Actually, I think maybe if we get this part right, everything will sort of be straightforward. I'm not sure how the memory aliasing will really work, but let's uh, let's um, take a look to see if we can, wait, 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 does this not make sense? Invalid receiver type decimals, decimals is a pointer type. Wait, what? What does that mean? Can I not do this is a question. Maybe I should really say type decimals is a struct that contains a byte. So this will probably be a little bit easier, right? This needs to be a pointer type because these slices can change in size, which I think means that this should be like this. And then decimals is gonna operate on pointers. Um, so you're kind of writing a little custom allocator that can type safely store decimal data in a slice of bytes. Yeah, that's basically right. Um, I don't know if I would call it an allocator just yet. I think I was talking about allocators earlier. Currently we'd have no allocator that's special. We just delegate directly to the go malloc implementation for these things, but it's sort of our desire to eventually have a custom allocator. Yeah, the some arena, I don't really, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Something like that. Um So, I think what we'll want to do here is basically say, okay, so to get the we'll first get the bytes at the ith slot. And I think what we need to do is essentially um why would this not fail? Like this should not compile, right? <laughs> this returns a, oh, c.bytes.get. Okay. So I think what we wanna do here is make a, we have to like sort of dream up the representation within the byte slice of um, how we're gonna represent this stuff. 
c.get would be an infinite loop, right? c.get would be saying, you know, call the the get L, the get function that we're defining right here. So that's not going to work out. I think what we need to do is come up with a way of representing inside of the byte slice an APD decimal. That's basically it, right? So what we need to do is store a form, a negative, an exponent, and a coefficient. And I wonder, should I try to do this with unsafe or should I try to like define it? It could be kind of cool to just define it. I think I can skip this. I think I, mm, I don't think I want to do it with unsafe. So with unsafe, I think what we could do is say like cast the bytes at a particular sort of spot in that byte slice to one of these things. But I think that's going to probably just be confusing. I think what we probably want to do is just put a little, make a little encoder decoder. Um, hey, thanks for the follow Kim tech. Um, and I think we'll probably want to like make a new file for this stuff, but I'm just going to sort of prototype it for now. So bytes is a byte slice. And I guess we would say, um, the first thing is, could be kind of like a word, just like a uint 16, cause it's just four little, little types, little elements here. And we could do all sorts of crazy bit packing. I suppose we probably don't need to do that right now. Um, do it the safe way, write test, benchmark, then think about unsafe. First things first, write up and safe code. Yeah, I agree. Data backs, data backs, data um, backs. Maybe what we should do instead of doing the decoder first, why don't we do the encoder first? I almost think that would be simpler. And let's actually, let's just go ahead and make a new file for this. So we're gonna have, we'll call it this decimal.go. And ultimately I think what we wanna say is a func in code APD decimal, code decimal. Um, this is gonna take an APD decimal and it's gonna return, well, I think it should take in an append to kind of byte slice. This is a pattern that we use. Um, that way we can sort of reuse any memory here that might be there. Um, and I guess it'll return a byte slice. And I think we'll say encode decimal um, adds, or yeah, it encodes the input decimal into the input byte slice uh, using, I guess this is like specifically an in-memory representation. So I don't know if we need to care like there's something about endianness somewhere, but I think I'll just ignore it because I don't think it matters. This is never going to go over the network or on disk or anything. I'll just say this for now. Okay, so um, pen two is equal to pen pen two, and then we need to figure out a way to turn the form into bytes. So how do we do that exactly? Um, I mean, I suppose I could just encode the whole form as a byte. That's pretty simple. I mean, I think I can literally just say byte of decimal.form. Does this work? <laughs> uh, this does work, but like, it's kind of weird. I wonder, does this work? Oh, this is a vendored file, so I can't even change this. I feel like this is fine. This is fine. This is never going to get a ton of values inside of it. Um, okay, so we'll do this. Then the next thing to encode is the negative Boolean. Um, and I guess I could do something with like, well, whatever, we'll, we'll do that later. Um, uh, can I, what happens if I cast a Boolean into a byte? <laughs> I don't know anything about this stuff, you guys. This does not work. So, negative, negative bit is equal to zero if, 
Maybe we can say var negative negative byte byte. <laughs> if decimal dot negative negative byte is equal to one, then we get to say append to append to negative byte. Okay, so that is pretty straightforward. Next up, we got our exponent, which is just an int 32. So how do I turn an int 32 into a sequence of bytes? There's got, I think there's like some library stuff for this, isn't there? Um, go int to bytes. Do, 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 do. There's this thing, right? Oh wait, this is like some kind of binary dot blah Indian dot put un thirty two are similar. Oh yeah, that is weird. Okay, so uh, binary dot, hmm, what happens if I just say, how do I get the like, how do I get like the processors one? <laughs> Is that not possible? I just want like, give me current endianness. It doesn't seem to be possible. I'll just use little endian because presumably everybody's, I don't know how this stuff works, you guys. How do I, uh... hmm, what's up by James? <laughs> don't get me ranting about the API design of that package. Is this like a well-known weird package? So we'll do put uint32 append to, um, decimal dot exponent, right? And I guess I have to cast this to a unit 32, but that should be presumably safe. Is this safe? This might not be safe, TBH, maybe. Oh, I guess it is safe, right? Because it's the same amount of bits. We can just like extract it out and then cast it back into an in 32 later and that should be fine, I think. Okay, so presumably this will actually re Turn. Oh no! I have to. I have to make sure that there's big enough. There's enough space in this thing. Um, stack overflow link, eh? Although relying still on the unsafe package, Google's TensorFlow API has <laughs> a nice solution for testing the endianness. What the heck? This is like kind of epic, dude. This seems like a little bit extreme. Should I actually bother to do this? I'll do this just for fun, but it's like unclear whether it's important. Um, this snippet is taken from Databanks, databanks, databanks. Hey, specificity. Thank you, man. I didn't get it right, but thanks for the um, the follow. You're not necessarily saying to do it. Well, you know, I think that's okay. I think we're just gonna do it anyway. Computers hooked into why over not? a thousand data banks throughout Native the world. Indian dot. Uh, hey, bye, James. Thanks for the follow. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we've got our native Indianness, <laughs> which is sketchy. So right, right, right. First, we actually have to assert that there's enough space in this slice, which I wanted to do anyway, actually. So why don't we just do it all up front? So how do we determine how much space we need in this slice? We need to have one byte for the form, one byte for negative, uh, four bytes for the exponent, and then n bytes for this thing. And n is given by what exactly? A word is a uint. 
What is a uint? A uint is just a 32. Oh, does this depend on the size of the machine word, presumably? Ugh. Um, no, we're explicitly not going to persist them to disk or go put them over the network. I haven't seen any better implementation of getting the system endy in this. Yes, I think all of those things are true. Um, so I guess what we probably want to do is be like, we want to be like, um, n bytes is equal to, so we, we have to say one plus, uh, uh, one plus, should probably make some cons for this or something plus unsafe dot size of uint or in 32 plus oh does this not work like this maybe oh is this like the wrong type now plus int of unsafe dot size of uint of zero times len decimal dot coef dot. Now, how do I get the underlying array of this thing? But how do I get <sighs> set bits provides raw unchecked but fast access to Z. But how do I get bits? Bitlen? Bitlen returns the length of the absolute value of x in bits? That doesn't. Dude, what? Is this what I should be using? <laughs> Bitlen? I feel like that's confusing. Jacoby, what the heck? Like I'm telling you this this big dot in thing is like really complicated for some reason that I don't really get. Bit of i, set bit and and not or x or not square root. I guess I have to use bitlen. <laughs> okay, bitlen returns the length of the absolute value. The bit length of zero is zero. No, this doesn't seem good, man. This honestly doesn't. I just want len of x. It's like literally all I want. Um. Well, this could be trouble. Let's see. Is there some way that APD decimal does it? I mean, presumably it's got to. Feel like the endianness should have been included in the standard lib, giving it the same everywhere. We should ask M. Dembski to implement it. Yeah, that would be good. M. Dembski, are you out there? <laughs> I need like a I need like an M Dembski bat signal. Sometimes he hangs out in the stream. How do I get the Like how do we even serialize this thing? That's another question that I have. Hold on. Let, so so actually let's let's do let's do something. Decimal is we do serialize this stuff. So presumably we have to figure this out at some point somewhere. Um and where would that be? That would be in Code. There's some kind of decode decimal ascending, encode decimal. Oh yeah. Decimal ENM computes and returns the exponent E in mantissa M for D. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Oh, you just like, <laughs> wait, what? Temp is equal to.
You have to get the text representation. This feels wrong, man. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, it's right. Everybody I think knows it's that here. relational databases don't scale because they use joins. Hey, joins, Iverson forever. Join, 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 Thank you so much right to uh, for this fresh tier one sub. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome to the stream. And it says that I actually got an emote thanks to your subscription. So I appreciate that. Uh, 2020 delivery. No idea what that is. Uh oh, project is out of date. Yo, Brohanser, what's up? Let me update that project. Pro commands. This is a, 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 a Fridayly ritual. Commands edit project. Um, uh, learning about uh, arbitrary precision decimals. Trying to make a flat bytes rep for them. Just gonna write a bot that hits you with an exclamation point project on stream startup. That does seem like a good idea. It's been discussed and shut down a lot of time due to the dumb stuff that people want to do with an endianness thing. That's probably a good point. That's a, I feel like that's a thing that happens. So bytes does, oh, this is seeming pretty good too. Fill bytes sets buff to the absolute value of X, storing it as a zero extended big endian byte slice and returns buff. Oh my God, okay. Well, this seems pretty good, right? If I say fill bytes on an int and it writes it to some buff and some like crazy representation that I guess I don't necessarily care about, is there a way to take these bytes and stick them back into a big dot int? I think if we could do that, then we should be really good to go. Um, Presumably fill bytes and set bytes are inverses, right? Hey, thanks for stopping by, Paul. Uh, you have a good weekend too. Oh yeah, set bytes and fill bytes are inverses. Okay, sick. Well, this is really good then. We can we can use set bytes and fill bytes and not have to do all this re-implementation ourselves. Hooray. Learning about APIs. Sort of working out for us. Let's go back to our new file. Um, and I guess now the question is, we st again need to actually figure out how many bytes to allocate for this though, which is it's sort of unclear if we can do that. Um, hey, thanks for the follow, Viraza. Um, fill bytes, right? The absolute value of X doesn't fit in buff. But how do I figure out this? Um... Oh, presumably it's, wait, what? Len of X times abs times Underscore S. Dude, why is this API so hard to use? It's brutal. It's truly brutal. Um, maybe we can find some other places where people use this. Maybe we can find some other places where people use this. All this crypto code. What does getting a flat bytes for the decimals give you? So we talked about this. Yes. So basically the idea is that zero copy is cool, but what we really care about is actually being able to understand, to, to allocate a single giant array just for decimals. So there aren't any heap accesses if you want to do, you know, summing up a bunch of decimals in a column or, you know, computing equality on, on the entire column. Um, so it's just sort of a single flat slice, uh, no heap pointer, no dereferences, no nothing. So that's one good reason. And the other good reason is that, um, to allocate a big slice of decimals, 
we want to be able to track all of the memory that's needed for that big slice of decimals without having to delegate any further to the Go allocator um, to make it happen. Does that make sense? And it's sort of sort of in, in service of one day being able to have our own allocator for all SQL operations. Seems tricky. I think it's I think it's not going to be that bad. Once we can figure out this sort of arithmetic stuff, I think we're we're gonna we're gonna be able to do it. I just I find it very irritating that it doesn't let you get this <laughs> this quantity. Um, although maybe this bitlen thing is actually the same thing. So bitlen gives me what? Yeah, it's some complicated, bizarre thing. Length of x in bits. Like who? Can't decimals have variable length? How do you allocate them all up front? Yes, so they, they do have variable length, um, but the thing is that um, just like we, we also have var lang, like other data types, like strings and bytes. And the way that those work is we allocate a fixed size array, but we keep, you know, we it's just, it's sort of dynamic, but it's just a single array instead of like, you know, N. Um, and actually that's a good point though. I think what we'll have to do one day is limit the size of batches based on the size of the bytes in the batches instead of just having a fixed size number of rows in the, the batches. That's a very good point actually. But you know, it, it's sort of, <laughs> I think I think we're like getting it in, in the right direction there. Like maybe maybe you have like a tiered set of varlan slice sizes or something like that. I have no idea. It's like far future stuff to be honest, but like you, you, this problem does need to be solved no matter what I think to get there. Bitlen. Can we use Bitlen for this? <laughs> Bitlen. Bit size. Dang it, this is so obnoxious. How do other systems do this like Postgres? Well, Postgres doesn't have a column or representation. I don't know how it stores decimals, but it's probably just sort of the same old, you know, heap pointer stuff that we do. Hey, crazy driver, what's up? Um, it's been going pretty good. Welcome back. Life stuff happens. We, 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 I understand life stuff very well. So it looks like everybody else tends to infer the size using some other kind of outside information, which is sort of frustrating. Okay, so this was the elliptic library. What are there other examples? PKCS, EM, make K, pub.size. Aha, okay, we did it, we did it. We found an example. Okay, so to get the number of bytes, you add bitlen plus seven, so you have a complete, like a, you know, you don't have like a s bunch of bits that like end randomly in the middle of a byte. So you sort of, wait a minute, what? No, this doesn't make any sense. Why would you add it to seven? Doesn't it depend? Oh, is this like integer division or something? Okay, I'm just gonna copy this and we can, we can uh, <laughs> but I basically hope that it works. Okay, so, so n bytes, uh, n uh, coef bytes is equal to, decimal dot it's a roundup yeah okay so roundup makes sense decimal dot coef dot bit len plus seven divided by eight okay so get the number of bytes that will need to reserve space for to store the entire coefficient of the decimal. Okay, so then we add up all this other crap that we were looking at, um, and we don't have to do any unsafe size of, we just say plus n coef bytes. Great, then we finally get to resize our append to thing. So we say if cap of append to is less than len append to plus n bytes, then append two is equal to, I guess we have to sort of re, 
Uh, so we'll just, we can just, well, we could do this, right? We could say append, append to make byte len. I think this is like optimized, right? Um, Okay, so we let's see. How does this work? Where no, we don't want this. I think in this case we just append append to, and then we subtract. We add the length of append. Uh... No, we literally just want the difference between the length of append to and the expected length. This is just n cof bytes, I think. So, right, like this. Something like this. Del Soka, do you like this kind of keyboard and why? I like this keyboard because it's it's more comfortable to have like your angles sort of inwards like this. It hurts my wrists less. Okay, so we're adding n cof bytes to the size of append to. I think this is basically right. Otherwise, we say append to is equal to append to and then slice it to len append to plus and bytes, something like this. Okay, then we should be good to go. We have enough space. And instead of doing this append stuff, I guess we can say um, append. Um, I guess actually what we really want is to, we actually wanna keep Man, this is so gross. I, isn't there a way to just like extend a slice's capacity to a particular number without changing its length? Because I, I want to kind of keep. No, we'll say we'll say l is equal to len append to. So this is going to be our original length here. Um, we'll resize it to its maximum. And then we're gonna try to write the right things to it at the right spot. So we'll say append to of L is equal to byte of decimal form. This is feeling like the wrong way to do things, but I don't really know. Um, append to of L plus one is equal to negative byte. Then we say, now what does this do? This just writes it directly in without having to, it doesn't reallocate anything at all, right? It just literally, yeah. So that's that's good. I mean, that sort of is fitting what we're trying to do here. We'll, so we'll say N plus, L plus two. Uh, like this. Well, you know what we should actually probably do is just say, um, decimal slice is equal to append to of, I think like this. And then we can just say decimal slice. Then we can sort of just write it directly into this slice without having to do any arithmetic, which I think is better. Oops. Decimal slice of one. Then we say decimal slice of two colon. Um, does this give me back how many bytes it wrote or anything? It doesn't, that's annoying. I guess we always know that it's four though. Um, and then we finally get to do our decimal dot coef dot copy bytes. What was it called? Set bytes. Fill bytes? It's fill bytes. Um, returns buff. There's no need for it to return buff though. It doesn't extend buff. So I don't know why that's important, but whatever. So we'll say fill bytes decimal slice of six. 
<laughs> this is like super sketchy. I don't know. Um, and then we return our append to, right? Okay, next I think we should write a decoder for this and like test the round trip to see if it works. Okay, so func decode decimal. Decimal apd dot, well, nope, this is gonna take a byte slice and it's gonna give me back an apd dot decimal as well as, we usually like to give back the remainder of the byte slice. And we might want to give back an error too, but can worry about that later. So to decode the decimal, um, well, I guess we just sort of reverse the process, right? So we say, first thing what we did was grab the decimals form. So we'll say form is equal to apd.form of bytes zero. We'll say, what's next? The negative byte? Negative byte is equal to, oops, int of bytes of one. And then we'll say, then we'll get our uint. So we'll say native Indian dot you int 32 decimal or bytes of two. This gives me back my exponent like this. And then I finally get to say, now I, right now there's this whole coefficient business. So how is this gonna work? Let's see. So let's, let's assemble our decimal. So ret is equal to apd.decimal. So the form is gonna be form. Um, the negative, I guess we have to sort of say, exponent, we'll say if negative byte is equal to zero, then well, if any byte is equal to one, then ret dot negative is equal to true. Right. Okay, what's wrong with this? Oh, I have to cast this guy to an int 32. And then we've got to figure out how to set this coefficient guy, which I think is going to be... Oh, dang. See, there's no way to do this. That is really too bad. There's, it kind of seems like there isn't an actual way to do this without allocating. Well, that's kind of a disaster. <laughs> yeah, what's up, Cobalt Ethan? How's it going? Well, I don't exactly know what to do about this problem. Why did I think, for some reason, I sort of thought that we would be able to set the bits of this nat thing directly, but it kind of seems like we can't. Oh wait, z dot make is something different. So you can reuse z if the size is less than the cap. So I wonder if there's a way to like point the nat at an existing slice. A little sad? That's not good. Is it the Friday night, Friday night, um, Melancholies. COVID makes us all a little bit sad. Ooh, the Arecibo thing. Yeah, that was really tragic. That was tragic. But don't worry, there's a lot of other telescopes out there. I think that Arecibo hasn't been used in a pretty long time, right? I mean, it was a sort of a meaningful symbol of our progress, but I think that it wasn't exactly like in the center of uh, scientific progress these days, right? Is there a way to sort of set, like point the NAT at something? I guess I, I should be looking not at the NAT interface because it's private. I should be looking at the big int interface.
was more famous for historic discoveries. Part of the telescope constellations that took a picture of a black hole. Ah, so set bits. This is definitely the thing that we want here. So set bits can be passed a into over slice a of data words. Banks throughout the world. And if we do that, it will literally just set the slice to the input slice, which is exactly what we want to do. The question is just how can we... I also missed this. There's bits and set bits. Okay, we want, we probably, probably want that, right? Okay, let's go, let's go back and, and change things around data a little bit. Data banks, data banks. Yo, thanks for the follows, right? Joy-Con and Beast Vore, Beast Vower. Um, let's go back and, and use this raw bits thing. Bits is equal to decimal dot coef dot bits. Data banks, data banks, data banks. Thanks for the follow root Knox as well. Okay. So the end coef bytes is now going to be just length of bits times unsafe dot size of. What is this? A, a big dot word, right? Big dot word. This is an int. <laughs> okay, here's a wait. Heck? Oh, do I have to? You know, it's kind of silly, you guys. If I say dot bits on this coefficient thing, it gives me back a slice of words. And a slice of words is not a slice of bits, it's a slice of words. So I think that that is, uh, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get our bits back. We're gonna unsafe size of it. We're gonna write it to this array down yonder. Um, so instead of doing fill bytes, we're now gonna say native data bags, data bags, data bags. No, we're just gonna use copy. We're just gonna say, copy decimal slice of six and into that decimal slice of six we're going to copy in Ooh, now how do we cast this word slice to a bytes slice i guess we'll have to um can i I guess I have to loop unless there's some kind of, um, thanks for the follow soy, soy, soy. Um, And of course, this byte order thing doesn't have just a uint method. <laughs> so I have to figure out, oh my God, this is like kind of obnoxious to be honest. I, I guess we can, declare a byte size two X the size of the word size. Well, it wouldn't be two X. It would be, um, I think each word is it depends on the processor's architecture, but on a 64-bit computer, it would be 8x the type, size of the word size, right? Unless I've gotten something backwards. Um, I think you would need to sort of do some unsafe casting stuff to make that work out. But it might be possible. 
Um, go unsafe, copy integer slice to byte slice. have to make a new slice header. Is it gonna be gnarly? Should I even bother doing this? Um, I think there's already some code that does this. C to unsafe go bytes or something. You know, You know, I don't think I'm gonna bother doing this. I think what I'm gonna do instead is probably we'll just do a loop. Um, so we'll say for i in range decimal slice, but we wanna do it unsafe, right? That's the whole point. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, Hey, Yahor, what is up? I have a question about the keyboard Microsoft Sculpt. Leave fingers on the keyboards without typing unwanted characters. I think it's possible. Yahor, we're looking, we're, we're thinking about flat decimals. We're thinking about flat decimals. That's the goal. Okay, I'm just gonna play, I'm just gonna copy and paste this stuff and see what happens. <laughs> Wait, actually I don't understand it. So what we wanna do is a, we wanna get a byte slice from a blah slice. So it kind of looks like this. Okay, so, and then instead of being a byte slice, I guess what we wanna do is say, wait, wait, byte slice from uint32 slice, from uint slice. I guess we wanna say from word slice, really, word slice, big dot word. Okay. Um, so, what we're gonna do is down here, when we get our bits out, we're gonna say copy from decimal slice. Well, first let's, uh, we'll get our um, 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 coef bytes is equal to byte slice from word slice and then pass in. Oh, instead of this is not a, this thing, this is actually a slice of big dot word. Okay. So then we pass in our bits, which is a confusingly named, why don't we call this, um, coef words coef bytes is equal to byte slice from word slice of coef words then we copy in our coef bytes into our decimal slice wow very cool okay um i think for this we can also this is our word size, and this thing is gonna be times word size as well. Okay, we did that. It's gonna be cool. So let's go back to our decode method. Um, we get our exponent, like we've done, 
We've got our negative, and now we just need to de get our bytes back out. So I guess to do that, we're gonna have to make an equivalent opposite direction method. Hello, Prevon, how's it going? Um, I don't know why these ones are so different, but we'll just copy all this stuff. <laughs> this is like a Stack Overflow programming day for sure. Kind of nice, that's good to hear, good to hear. An x86, a word is two bytes. Now, is that, does that make any sense? Does that make any sense? I think this word thing is a confusing term that I never understand, but let's take a look at the definition of it. A word represents a single digit of a multi-precision unsigned integer. A uint, a uint is an unsigned integer type that is at least 32 bits in size, my friend. 32 bits in size. So it's going to be more than two bytes, right? It's going to be four bytes on a 32-bit architecture and eight on a 64-bit architecture. Um, yeah, to be honest, I have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what an x86 word or a go word is. I'm just going after the definition of this uh, thing. So truthfully, I have no idea, man. <laughs> if you tell me that's a D word, I would believe you. If you messed up advent of code day four part two so hard needed help. I did advent of code a few years ago, but I can't do it anymore because it requires that I stay up so late at night, right? It's like the problems drop at 12 at midnight on East Coast, which is like, oh my gosh, I can't stay up past midnight to do advent of code problems, even though I would like to. Okay. Um, so we're gonna make our byte slice from word slice. So x86 assembly declares a word, a D word or a Q word. Ah, I see. Okay, well that I did not know. That's good to know. I think this 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 like word concept is a very ambiguous one and I don't like it. I feel like I've made this mistake several times in my life. Yeah, it confuses me too. Word slice from byte slice. This is gonna get a byte and it's gonna give me back a big dot word slice. And I guess I don't do them to get them done finished. I just want to do them to challenge myself. Won't do it tomorrow because you're away and do it on Sunday and said, that makes sense. Yeah, it's good challenges for you as a junior. I think that is a great, I think that they're very good challenges to try to learn a little bit about. Well, to be honest, I think they're, they're sort of more oriented towards competitive programming type challenges. But I do think that just doing any kind of programming is good practice. And it's what's so cool about it, I think, is that it's, it's like in the zeitgeist, you know, everybody's doing it right about now. So it's like, doing the problems it, you know, you can find a forum, you can go on Reddit, you can chat with the people who worked on it and learn a little bit. I, I'm a big fan of the concept. And here, I guess I put in word size. Okay, so then down here, we're gonna say, um, I guess what we'll do here is we'll actually just say ret.coef.setbits. And then here we're gonna pass in word slice from byte slice. Of bytes of six. And then I think we can return ret comma bytes of hmm. Now, how do I figure out? Ooh, no, something here is wrong. We, we need to know the length of this thing. We don't actually have it written down anywhere. So we, we're, we're sort of missing something. We need to, we, I guess we have to decide, is this gonna be like a, like a zero terminated encoding or a length prefixed encoding? And I think we need to make it a length prefixed encoding um, because these 
otherwise we'd have to have an escape based encoding, which we don't really want to do. So I guess what we should just do is put a length here um, after our, and we should, we should definitely diagram all this at some point, but I'm gonna do that later. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll say native endian dot put un32 32 bits that should be plenty for the size of this thing hopefully um and so we're gonna put decimal slice six and then we're gonna call it a un32 of len of We'll do n bytes. And then here we're gonna have, instead of six, it's gonna be 10. Okay. So then likewise over here, we're going to say uh, n bytes is equal to, I guess, n coef bytes. So we're gonna native endian u at 32 of six. And then here what we do is we say 10 to 10 plus n coef bytes, I think. So then we get exactly just the bytes that we care about. We set them and then we get to return bytes of 10 plus n coef bytes like this, so the rest of the byte slice. Okay. <laughs> um, this seems like it might work. And so now I think we should write some tests to see if it actually does work. In the meantime, I think we need to go and undo a bunch of the other changes that we did to like sort of start with this whole situation. So we have this new file and let's, let's undo the changes that we made to native types because we're not at all ready for that. So we'll just undo this all together. Um, undo this all together. And let's go ahead and write some tests now. Um, so let's make a new file, decimal test. Presumably, hold on a minute. I bet we already have a bunch of similar tests that do this. Right, like decimal encode, decimal. We have like a couple of different encodings, right? Um, and what I would like to use do is probably like reuse the test cases. That could be kind of good. Um, test encode decimal rand. Oh yeah, this is gonna be good. So we can reuse all these test cases just on a different kind of uh, thing. So we'll do that next. I'm gonna just quickly run to the bathroom. Just give me one minute and I will be right back and we'll do the tests.
Okay, I am back from my quick break and ready to write some tests. <laughs> okay, so the nice thing is that we do have all these test cases already that probably have a bunch of weird edge cases for decimals, so we don't have to come up with those again, which would be kind of sad. So here's what we're gonna do. Looks like we've got this loop. We loop over the test cases. We have some subtests and stuff like that. I think what I'll do, <laughs> nice, okay, hey. Uh, so I added a new channel points reward and you can customize a comment with a single word uh, if you redeem it. And I think, thank you MD layer for giving me the first of this kind of challenge. And I th what, what this means is that I, I would like to uh, challenge myself to um, sneak indubitably inside of a comment somewhere and then get it checked into the Cockroach TV source code. So uh, um, hmm, I'm gonna think about this one. <laughs> I think this one might be pretty easy, honestly, because here's what we're gonna do. Um, here's what we're gonna do. Um, <laughs> 12 point six K points. <laughs> I think I think what we're gonna do is talk about how it's safe, <laughs> how it's safe to uh, do one of these slice axes or something. <laughs> oh man. Hmm, is that a good is that a good way to do it? There's a lot of things that we we would really like to be indubitably true at this point of the code, but uh, which one should it be? I think the problem is that like I can't put a I can't put that comment on any single one of these things. Um, because they all have the same exact property. Okay, so how about this? Uh, decode decimal um, decodes a, a flat bytes decimal representation into an APD decimal without doing any allocations. Um, we, this function will well, we don't even want it to panic is the thing. Like ideally this would actually return an error here and we would check ahead of time whether there's sufficient length to like not panic. Um, um, because uh, this flat bytes representation never is serialized to the network or to disk, um, we can safely, <laughs> we can perform all slice axes without worrying about, this is just like a lie, dude. Oh man, this is tough. Out of bounds since Uh, we've indubitably allocated sufficient space in the input byte slice in an earlier call to encode decimal. <laughs> this is this is this is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. We can come back to this. We can come back to this. Uh, but for now, I think we're just gonna we're just gonna call it done. We're gonna call it done. Okay, let's come back to our testing. So we're gonna make a new test case here. So we'll say t dot run, and the name of this is gonna be, well, you know what we should actually do? Uh, should probably just put it at the end of this other sub test case thing. So we'll say t dot run um, flat decimal encoding. What's up, super amazing coder? If you hit if you hit us with the uh, the bang IDE, you'll get an informational bit about that. Funk t testing dot t. Okay, so to do this test case, 
uh, we're gonna say um, B is equal to data banks, data banks, data banks. Oh, we could just say var b byte. Thanks for the follow, super amazing coder. Then we're gonna say call data dot uh, encode decimal. And then the test case's decimal name is what exactly? C dot value, C dot value. C dot value, B. Right Joy-Con says, is Go a good language? I have never been able to get into it for some reason. I think it's a pretty great language. Depends on what you're doing, um, of course. All languages have their pros and cons, depending on the use case. But I think for system software, pretty good language. <laughs> Pronounced the name correctly on the first slide. Deserves follow. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sidetrack from whatever you've been working on, trying to think of a good word. <laughs> Okay, so then we're, so we're gonna encode the decimal uh, and then we're, let's decode it and then this assert is the same. I feel like that's a good enough test case for now. So um, uh, um, out decimal or decoded, I guess. Decoded is equal to apd.decimal. Well, var decoded apd.decimal. And we'll say call decimal. pass in Oh wait, this returns an APD decimal? I feel like what this should really do, because this is gonna accidentally, accidentally um, heap allocate stuff because these these have decimal receipt or pointer receivers. So I think what we actually wanna do is, is change this thing to take in an APD decimal. APD. Um, decode into. Right. What's up, Iverson again? Thanks again for the, the sub earlier. I have a jar of cashews that I'm about to eat. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're gonna decode into this APD decimal. I don't think that we need to. Um... Yeah, I think this should should work okay. <laughs> bon appetit, thank you. Eating out of a jar is pretty hipster. Um, so we'll pass in our B, we'll pass our decoded. And then I think all we do is say T dot, or I guess we just do this, right? So, and then instead of comparing with decimal, we'll compare with decoded. And yeah, I feel like that's all there is to it. So why don't we see what happens when we run this test? So we'll say make test package equals package sql package util encoding test equal test encode decimal. I'm expecting that this will probably crash or do something horrible on the first time. Well, import cycle not allowed in test. Okay, so I've done something wrong. Um, looks like call data depends on encoding. So I can't put these tests here. That is unfortunate. I wonder if I can move Um, oh, I see, it goes this way. You know what I should do? I should just move these uh, these methods into uh, the encoding package. It's pretty straightforward. So why don't we just copy all this stuff? Oh. You know what we'll do is we'll make a new file called um, flat decimal. And we'll move all of this stuff into that file.
And then to be honest, wait a minute. What's going on with this? What's going on with all of this? Come on, little buddy. Do your thing. Word size read declared in this package. Uh, okay, well, it's a different kind of word size, I think. So we'll need to redeclare it. We'll just call it something else. Big word size. Big word size will declare tosses of the same name. What? <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, so we can just use, what the heck? Oh God, don't tell me we already have done a bunch of, have we, are we just like redoing a bunch of work here? I hope not. Well, good thing we moved it to a different package. I feel like that's a good thing. Get rid of this. Word size, we wanna change this to be big word size. Um, is this custom bash ZSH prompt? Yeah, it's a custom prompt in ZSH. You can look at my config on GitHub if you're interested in how it looks. The comment thing is out of stock. I th oh, I think what the, so what I did is I changed it so that you could only do one per hour, but I guess that's a global limit, it sounds like, and not per person limit, which sounds a little bit too slow. So I'll change that. Um, I'll change that because that seems, seems kind of boring, doesn't it? You'll stick around for another hour. Submit. I want your I want your word, you know. I don't want you to go away without sending me your word. All right, sick. Okay. So, let's call this some um, encode flat decimal. All right, and then this stuff we can delete, delete it later um, here. So here we wanna just change it to say decode flat decimal, encode flat decimal. Okay, so now I think our import cycle is probably gonna be fixed. Let us try this again, see what happens. I still think it's gonna probably crash. Okay, it didn't crash. Oh, it did crash. Okay, sick. So index out of range zero with length zero. That is a great sounding fail. So let's uh, take a look at why. Now, I thought that we, um, I thought the whole point here I thought the whole point here was that we just uh, made a bigger bite slice. <laughs> what did I do wrong here? If the capacity of append to, so this is zero, if this is less than the length of append to, also zero, plus n bytes, true, append to is equal to append, append to, make, n coef bytes. Oh, that's the wrong quantity, first of all, but I don't think. So while I'm doing this, I, I did want to check. Um, Big word size. We have this word len. That seems right. We can use it though. Word len of coef words. 
It makes out of length three with length zero. Up here we had something different. So, okay, 92. Makes out of range three. So we made it all the way down here, which is cool. Um, oh, I see the problem. We need to say two times this. We need to document this pretty well because this is getting sketchy. Why don't we uh, a flat decimal is a bytes representation of an APD dot decimal. It is organized as follows. Um, isn't there like a cool way of doing this sort of thing? Like with some ASCII art? Um, so we'll say first there's the form byte, then there's the negative byte. Then there's a, what's up Rafi SS? Then there's the exponent eight exponent, no, four exponent bytes. Four. You know what? Oh, no, no, I know it. I know, I know the cool way to do this. So you say form, you say negative, you say exponent, then you say length of coef bytes, then you say coef bytes. And then down here, you get to put a little like Uh, one byte. <laughs> How are you supposed to do this? I I swear I've seen like you know who would know about this stuff is MD Layer. MD Layer is always making network protocols, and in network protocols they have a lot of stuff like this. So MD Layer, I implore you. How do you make a good looking diagram for this stuff? Okay, so this will be good. And I think that this will solve our bug, presumably. Okay, let's try again. Some program to spit out the ASCII art? You're probably right. Okay, we still have exactly the same problem. Nice, we're doing good. Oh no, it's a slightly different problem. The index out of bounds is actually in this crazy, weird, unsafe thing. So that's cool. Um, okay, so the problem now is actually that we can't index into the word slice, which is pretty weird. Why would that be the case? Oh, presumably there's there's cases where the size of the word slice is zero and we have to deal with that. Um, so I guess basically if n bytes is equal to zero, then I guess we'll say if n bytes is greater than zero, then do something. Something like that. Let's try that out. Because I guess there's in circum if if the form is set to nan or infinity, then you don't have any bytes of coefficient to write out. Okay, it didn't help. <laughs> it didn't help. Um. Well. Well, oops, I need to say n coef bytes. This code's tricky, guys. It's very subtle. Well, it's not that subtle. It's just like you have to have it be correct. Kind of like any code. Oh. 
Oh, this is more exciting though. Okay, so, we, oh, we made it to decode. You guys, this is big progress. Decode flat decimal. Size bounds out of range 20 with capacity 16. It's probably the same thing as this zero thing. So I bet it's on line 123, yeah. So if n coef bytes is greater than zero, then we do this. All right. Line 124. Okay, so slice bounds out of range 20 with capacity 16. It's the same problem. And we didn't get defended by our NCOF bytes greater than zero guard, which is a little bit, a little sus. I would say that this is a little sus. Are we supposed to cast this to N32? I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, are we? Are we? N byte starts as an integer. Then we cast it to a unit 32. We put it, and to get it back out, we decast it. So that seems, that actually seems. I think technically it should be an ordinary int. I don't think this is going to fix anything. <laughs> In fact, I'm like 90% sure that it won't. But perhaps it's time to whip out the old debugger. What do you guys think? Let's do it. Well, well. I think we should. I think we're gonna I think we're gonna play debugger here, because I think the debugger will be very efficient this time around since we're not doing anything complicated uh, with the whole server. It's just a tiny little function, perfect for debuggers. Let us let us I think this is actually a moment you all have been waiting for. I think I've been Telling, I've been talking about Delve on the stream for a very long time and never using it. So maybe this is maybe this is the time that we use Delve on the stream. We'll see if we can um, survive this initial compilation phase. I, I feel like I usually stop it right about now. I'm like, oh yeah, it's got to like recompile the entire CockroachDB source code. Um, and my stream gets all jerky. I'm like, forget this. And I stopped doing it, but maybe today it'll work. Did you know that we encode decimals that end in 0000, zero, zero, zero incorrectly? I did not know that. What do you mean? Create table A, A and primary key, B decimal. Actually, forget the A and. Insert into A, oops. Insert into a values 0 0.000. I don't know, it seems good to me, my dude. Seems good to me. There's an issue link. All right, so we are in our test case. I will click on that issue link later, perhaps. We are in our issue link. We are in our test case. Um, let's take a look at what we've got here. So we, we encode our, so what is our decimal here? Our decimal, it's a NAN, zero exponent and a coefficient with nothing inside. Okay. So let's actually take a look at the bytes that we've encoded here. Length is 10, cap is 16. Now that is a little bit weird, right? I don't know why we would have 16 cap, that feels, that feels a little cap. <laughs> who's who's like Gen Z enough to say cap? Because I don't think I qualify. Um, so it should it should add up to one plus two two, eight ten. So I just don't see why we're actually getting these extra. Hmm. 
You know what we should do? We should probably just enter the debugger and, and come right to here. So let, let's actually just try this again. So we'll, we'll, we'll restart the debugger. Try to understand why we think that we were supposed to allocate an entire six bytes for this coefficient that we think should really be zero bytes. Okay, so we get our coef words. Our coef words are nil, right? And so our word len is what? Our word len, or our n coef bytes is zero. So wait, what the heck? And our n bytes is 10. Well, that seems correct. So how can we get up to 16 then? That's the next question. Append to has cap 16. Okay, so something is just busted about the way that Oh, is this just the way that append works though? Did append just decide to make a bigger slice than I wanted? It's got to, right? Append was zero, n bytes was the right thing. So I think that, I think it was just append sort of behaving funny. All right, well, that's fine. So let's step through. Uh, we got our decimal slice. Um, our decimal slice is starting, it's got len 10 cap 16, just like the original slice. We add our negative byte. So our slice now looks like what? It's got three at the beginning here because the form is three. It's zero for the negative byte, which is what we expect. We put our decimal exponent, which is zero. I mean, this is it's just like basically the simplest case. Um, it's literally just, uh-oh, stream, come back. Stream, are you back? Stream. Hello. I think stream is back. I don't know what's going on with my internet today, you guys, but a bunch of zeros. Um, then we put, ah, well, this is wrong. This is the problem right here. This needs to say you went 32 of n coef bytes and not n bytes. I think that is the issue. Okay. Let's try running the test again without the debugger. It didn't go down at all. That's kind of weird. I definitely dropped like a thousand frames at least. Maybe there was some buffering or something. Oh, nice. Okay, so we no longer crash, but now we just, everything is wrong. <laughs> so that's like some good progress, right? It kind of seems like the problem is negative. Negative bytes are wrong. Um, so that seems relatively easy to fix. So negative byte, if it's negative, set it to one. Set it in the decimal slice. And then in decode, we say, if negative byte is one, set negative to true. Okay, that actually seems legit. Oh, uh, the problem is that um, we need to pass a pointer here. That is the issue. We're just editing a copy in memory. Makes no sense. Okay, so here we pass the pointer to. Let's try it again. Everybody knows that relational databases don't scale because they use joins, joins, join, join, joins, and write to disk. Yo, Yolo Shmolo. Thank you so much for that prime gaming subscription. I really appreciate the sub and the support. How are you doing? Welcome to the stream. Um, holy crap, we passed the tests. That's pretty legit. Um, that is very legit. So let's actually go ahead and um, make sure that we pass these random tests too. Um, I guess we should make a little method for this thing, right? So it's like literally just going to be the same. 
So let's uh, we'll extract this guy into, uh, how do I do this again? There's like an extract function, isn't there? Introduce method, extract method. So this is gonna be, um, whoops. Um, assert round trips. Uh, flat decimal, cert, flat decimal round trips, cert, flat decimal round trips. And why is it taking an anonymous struct exactly? That feels random. It should take in, um, should take in a vapd.decimal. I think that's it, just like this, right? PG encodes one zero 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 as <laughs> zero 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 one zero 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 one zero 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 one, whereas CRDB encodes it to zero 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 one zero 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 one zero 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 FFFC zero zero oh one. PG has this logic for truncating zeros, but CRDB truncates more aggressively. That does sound painful. Uh, so you mean, you mean encoding specifically for the like wire representation, presumably like we encode it correctly internally. And we just like send something back a little bit differently than what people expect. I would guess, I would hope. Okay, so we'll do this. We'll say c dot value, so we can pass the uh, I guess we should be passing this thing as a pointer too. I guess I don't know. It seems like probably. Okay. Just hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Yo, Sardini, thank you for the follow. So down here, we can just literally call this once and it uh, will do the same thing. So assert flat decimal round trips will pass in our cur. Um, and the test is called test encode decimal rand. So if we just say this, it'll test all of that, I'm pretty sure. Why rolling your own, um, why rolling my own what exactly? R-U-R-I-U-I. Did that actually test everything? I can't remember. Test flags equals dash V. We roll a lot of our own on here. This is a roll your own kind of stream. Okay, nice. So we're passing all the test cases, that's sweet. Well, let's go ahead and uh, reinventing big int. Um, not exactly. We're definitely not re-implementing big int. Um, we're just trying to make sure that we can represent it in a flat byte slice um, so that for sort of efficiency, um, since we're trying to implement a columnar representation of data in this SQL database that we work on. Um, we don't like it when, in order to access the data in a particular data column, we have to follow any pointers because that's really inefficient. It hurts the cache locality. Um, so we prefer it if we can make sure that all of the data is, is in a single um, sort of contiguous slice of memory. So that's why we're sort of blitting out all of the data inside of all of these big ints into a contiguous slice. That's the idea anyway. We'll see, we'll see, uh, <laughs> we'll see how far we go with it. What's up, say six. <clears throat> I 
Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and make a new branch for all this stuff, by the way. So we'll call this flat deck. What's up, Astyanix? Wow, uh, <laughs> that brings back some interesting memories, Astyanix, of a uh, network library for Cassandra. <laughs> Spent a lot of hours of my life playing with that network library. It was spelled a little bit differently than your name, but uh, did remind me of that. Okay, so let's see here. We're gonna specifically add all of this stuff. We'll say encoding, add flat bytes. Flat decimal encoding, decimal encoding. Makes sense, I suppose, but you have to deal with the column being arbitrarily wide if you don't want to follow a pointer, right? Yes, so you definitely do. Um, but we already sort of have support for um, variable length data sizes in this system. Um, we, we already support strings and byte types as in this sort of flat bytes encoding. Um, so we're going to sort of hook into the mechanism that we already have for that rather than redoing all of that. So I'm hoping that we can kind of sort of combine these two representations. So we, we will we'll get the the guts from the byte string one and apply it to the decimal one, essentially. Will you do tests of a performance to compare with previous? Absolutely. That's a big, big and important part of this project is to, I mean, hopefully we're going to have a more efficient thing at the end, but uh, if we don't, that would be a problem. So we're absolutely going to be testing it at some point, once, we, once we're once we sort of closer to a, a prototype. Yes, you do want to be able to do operations on it, but the thing is that our representation is, everything's immutable in our columnar representation. So yeah, I agree that having to do the in-place operations would be nearly impossible, um, but I'm hoping that we can figure out a way to be tricky enough about things that we can make it work. So you're very right that there's going to be some sketchiness there. Like for example, if we wanted to add a constant decimal to another decimal, we wouldn't want to be reusing the same memory of the first decimal to do the addition inside of. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to sort of allocate a flat decimal slot at the very end of the flat decimal slice representation in the new column, do the operation sort of um, on that part of memory um, and it won't overwrite anything because it's at the end of the columnar representation. We we get away with this sort of thing in the bytes and string representations and I'm hoping that we can do a similar thing if if a little bit more complicated with the decimals. We'll just have to see though. Um, it's definitely, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we might we might run into trouble. I, I don't I don't exactly know. Um, okay, so we I think we did add some sort of pointless files here we we so we moved this and we didn't delete it so let's just go ahead and delete that old file package call call data decimal dot go decimal test dot go okay so now that we've done this, I think the next step would be to go back to what we were trying to do at the beginning, where we change what we declare as the decimal representation in our column stuff, something like that. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this again. So if we are returning a Computers hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Okay, so so as you can see, this is this is like our old representation, where we return a column slice of decimals as a slice of apt.decimals, which have p pointers. So what we're going to change this to is um, we're going to make a new struct. This is what we did before, but we didn't really get it to work yet. Um, and we're going to embed this flat byte structure, which is the thing that I was talking about. This is our flat representation of a bunch of bytes values. Um, and so decimals is a flat representation of apd.decimal objects, something like this. Now, I think 
if we can just sort of follow through and break, fix all the various compilation errors, I think we'll like get really close to being like done-ish with this idea, maybe. There's definitely gonna be some like lifetime issues. In other words, like in certain circumstances, we like let these decimal things escape out of the sort of nice immutable land into a, a mutable and scary land where we need to make sure that we have a full mutable copy of the decimal or we'll run into bad problems. But um, I, I'm hoping that we can do that at the edges, but we'll see. So to get a decimal from a slice of, from our bytes representation of a decimal, the first thing that we do is we get the bytes at a particular slot. So we'll say bytes is equal to C dot bytes dot get of IDX. And then we decode into this APD decimal. So we'll say var ret apt dot decimal. Now this is gonna be suspicious. I think this is gonna end up accidentally allocating, but I don't think there's anything we can do about that right now. Unless we started having this thing pass in an apd dot decimal, but that's not gonna happen. Um, so we'll say var ret apd decimal return, and we'll say um, encoding dot uh, decode flat decimal, pass in bytes, pass in ret, and then we return ret. Um, and that's basically all there is to it, right? I think this is probably no longer going to be GC assert inlineable. Seems like definitely not. My theme in ZSH, it's just something that I made up. If you look at the Z profile or something, it I don't remember. <laughs> but it's all in that it's all in that config uh, folder. If you look through it. Okay, so then to uh, decimals.len. I think for this, it's going to be like c.bytes.len, like this, right? Okay. Um, well, surely that's not the only... Yeah. So how do we make a column of decimals? Instead of saying make decimals, we're going to say um, return decimals of bytes of new bytes of length. Okay. Um, you know what I could do is actually, I was pointlessly because I think I embedded the bytes thing, so I don't think I need to re like select that selector, so to speak. What was I doing? Like this thing. I think I can just say m dot decimal dot set length. I don't need to say m dot decimal dot bytes dot set length. Okay. So then we can just get rid of this thing altogether. Get rid of this thing altogether. Cool. Well, you know what we should do? Let's just let's just uh, let's just run like make test package equals. Let's just like run one of these big tests and see what like doesn't compile. Because otherwise, I'm not sure how we're gonna find um, what's not working. Oh, we'll have to probably. <laughs> So we have to regenerate all of this generated code. Um, but I don't think that I changed nearly enough stuff for this to make any sense. So I need to remember what are the files that I need to actually change. 
now that I've changed this representation, like datum to vec temple, for example. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, where the heck is this stuff? I, I just can't remember where it lives. There's this, uh, there's a file where we define these like template functions that tell you how to work with each of the types. And now that I haven't spent time in this code in a long time, I just don't remember where it lives. Um, uh, No, your is in the chat. <laughs> uh, if your is in the chat, I just need to remember where where our oh yeah, it's these customizers, right? Where do our customizers live? Type customizer. I just need to remember where the special decimal stuff lives. Uh. <laughs> Probably not that. <laughs> Actually, maybe we don't need to change anything. Well, this is this is something that we're going to need to change. To physical representation, how a single no, this is going to say the same as well. Well, actually, let's just go ahead and do this again to see what is completely broken. Back to datum gen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How horrible. Hmm. Um, back. Oh yeah, these things. I definitely need to be touching these things. These things are very important for me to change. Um, right, like isn't there overload base? What's up, Walt Colder Bear? Ah, yes, this is this is the true file. Thank you, Yohor. I forgot where this one lived. Okay, well, you know, the good news is that all we have to do to fix this is now... The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do that? By guessing. I think all we have to do, thanks for the follow, by the way, SA6, is, um... I think we just... I think we just use the same thing here as we do in bytes, right? Because it's underlying going to be the same thing that a byte slice does. I think we can just delete this. Could be kind of cool. The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do that? By guessing. Thanks for the follow, Oscaralian. Oscaralan.
Yeah, there's like a bunch of things that we need to fix here. A pen, valve, window. I think we have to fix all of them. I think I, I kind of jumped the gun there. Um, let's take a look at uh, what would be wrong with this thing first. A pen slice from call. This is not working quite right. Oh, I see. So I guess maybe what we ought to do is implement a pen slice on top of decimal that delegates to bytes with the right types. I think that's what we probably should do. I think that would be good. Because otherwise we're going to have trouble. We're going to have to make customize this to say dot bytes, you know, and that's pretty gross. So I think what we'll do is we'll we'll implement a pen slice on top of decimal. So where is my decimal thing living? It's in vec.go. You know, this is again, I think I do want to make a new file called decimal um, to mimic the bytes one. And I think we'll just implement this. Well, we don't need it to be so complicated. In fact, it'll be very simple. And in fact, it can take a non-pointer type, I believe, decimals. Um, and it's going to take a source decimals as well. And what this is going to end up doing is just say b dot append slice. Whoops, b dot bytes dot append slice source dot bytes dest source source end. That's it. I think. And then this will compile properly. I think. Trouble is what? It wants to be a star decimals. Well, there's no need for that. Okay. Um, great. So then we've just got to figure out what's wrong with all this stuff. I guess what's happening here is what exactly? Vec temple. Pen slice. I think we need to update these next ones now. Um, our we need to update all these. Let's just start here. So instead of this whole thing, we can just uh, tell it to do the same thing as bytes family. It does kind of make me wonder whether we should have merely. whether we should have merely, um... no, I think this is right. Like I was gonna say, we could theoretically just represent decimal family as a regular old. No, 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 never mind. Forget everything that I'm saying. I think this is gonna be correct. Okay, so I think same thing as before, we're gonna need to make a pen val on top of decimal that works the same as the one as on bytes. It's just, it um, converts the two or something like that, maybe. A pen val. So what does this do? Ah, yes. We'll definitely need to do this. So we'll implement it here. This is going to take a D decimals. I want this to be D, not B. But the thing is that instead of taking a byte slice, it's obviously going to have to take an apd.decimal. I think. Now this is something I'm not entirely sure of, right? Like by the time that it trickles over here, let's take a look at this data generated code. A val is going to be dot get. Yeah. So it has to be the sort of underlying type here. Okay. So cool. So in order to do an append val, it's really going to be the same thing as we did before where we first convert it. So we'll say encoding dot encode flat decimal, pass in V. Now, now I'm concerned again about this pointerness. I think that we, well, I just don't want this thing to end up allocating. Whatever, we can play with that later. So in pass in encode flat decimal, the append to, now this is trouble. This is trouble. 
Because what we really need to do is figure out the length of this before knowing its actual contents. That's very important because otherwise we're going to have to allocate a temporary byte slice in order to deal with this, which we really don't want to do. So I think we'll need to implement a length method back in our encoding function, encoding file. So over here, which will, I think that's, this will actually be good for us because we, we keep, um, whoops, it's flat decimal. So let's make a new function called func uh, flat decimal len. What's up, Gyro? Yes, arbitrary precision is a thing. It just requires arbitrary space. <laughs> so you can have it if you are willing to pay arbitrary space. So flat decimal len is going to take a decimal apd dot decimal, and it's going to return an int. Flat decimal len returns the number of bytes in the encoded, in the in the flat bytes encoded version of the input decimal. Okay, so I think for this, we basically just want to, can always encode decimals as strings, absolutely. Absolutely, and that's more or less what this uh, this is doing, just in a slightly, slightly more efficient way than regular ASCII. Now, I guess we can just say n bytes is equal to flat decimal len of decimal. It's a little bit inefficient because we're going to re recall this, but I don't think it really matters. Um, well, I guess. Maybe we just implement it twice because we do want to be able to get the ncoF bytes separately and stuff like that. Well, I suppose we could uh, we could make another function here. So func um, uh, flat um, flat decimal len from bits. So this is going to take a big dot word. And it's going to return two integers and the integers are going to be total len coef bytes. They're both going to be integers. Total n coef bytes is equal to this thing. Pass in our coef words and we'll return total len plus coef bytes. Wait, 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 what? Total len plus coef bytes? No, we'll just return coef. We'll just return total len. Um, well, we'll just rename this. Instead of total n, this is gonna be um, uh, header len. And then we'll rename this to also be header len. Okay, so I think this is, I think this makes sense, right? We're gonna, uh, see below for the layout of a flat decimal. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get this in bytes is equal to header len comma n coef bytes is equal to flat decimal len from bits. All of this in the name of just like reducing a couple of lines of code. It feels like a waste of time, but whatever. We already went down the rabbit hole n bytes is equal to header len plus n coef bytes. Hooray, we're DRY, we're DRY. Okay, so back into our append function. To do an append, we need to first figure out how big our decimal will be. So we'll say um, n bytes is equal to flat, wait, what did I call it again? Flat decimal len, flat decimal len. Pass in V. Is this a specific technique or format? No, I just sort of hand rolled it. 
Um, the, the reason that we're hand rolling this format is because it's really just for in-memory use. Um, we have another encoding format for on-disk and over the network that's like more specific and more kind of like well-defined. Um, but this is just really for in-memory. Uh, so we don't really care how janky it is, so to speak. I think when you're designing serialization formats, normally you want to be kind of careful, but if it's really just for like some in-memory, you know, peek and poke kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter too much. <laughs> Bespoke artisanal Byte encodings, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Okay, so we're gonna say d dot b bytes dot maybe backfill offsets. The computer's hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. So I guess we just pass in our own length. Is that the idea? D dot bytes dot len. Thanks for the uh, follow, bearded superhero. Um, okay, so we do our maybe backfill offsets. And then I guess what we do is, oh wait, do we do that or do we just sort of, we just delegate, right? What am I, what am I doing? What we do is we want to say d.bytes.append val. And then we pass in our, oh no, no, no. We don't want to delegate because the whole point, right? The whole point was that we wanted to save allocations here. If it's even possible. To be honest, it might not be that possible. No, I think we can. I think, well, it depends on if we have extra capacity in this data slice, um, which I suppose is possible. Hopefully it's possible. I mean, I think this is kind of something that we could improve in the bytes representation. I don't know how append works under the hood. I always forget, but if it doesn't, like make more space than necessary, then you're really going to waste a lot of time just incrementally growing this array when you should be doing it in a dynamic fashion. So I don't, yeah, I don't know, but basically here's what we're going to do. We won't delegate. We'll maybe backfill our offsets. We're going to say d.bytes.data. So we'll, we need to figure out whether we have capacity or not. So we'll say if d.bytes.data, if cap, cap of this, um, if len of d dot, if, all right, so we're going to subtract the length from the cap. So if cap dot d dot bytes dot data minus len of d dot bytes dot data is greater than or equal to n bytes, then we get to just kind of copy it, <laughs> right? So we get to say d dot bytes dot data is equal to, then we, we, we're going to re-slice it to be the proper length. So len d dot bytes dot data plus n bytes. Um, otherwise, uh, so I'll just make a comment because this is not that obvious. We'll say we have enough capacity in our backing slice to avoid reallocating. Now, otherwise, now here's a question, right? Like, do we, should we be the ones to control how much, like how much more we allocate in a sense? Um, I think we kind of have to, because we can't use append here because we don't have, <laughs> we don't have anywhere to like write into in a sense. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We also, this is not quite right. We're going to just call, um, um, encoding dot encode decimal encode flat decimal pass in v and then here what we do is we pass in our d dot byte oh wait a minute doesn't this thing already this thing like kind of works doesn't it this thing works no matter what the size of a pen to is so actually i think we get to just use this without having to do anything fancy Right, we we already do this capacity checking thing in here, um, so like we're we're kind of good to go. 
Okay, so we don't even have to do these checks. That's fantastic. So we literally just say encoding.encode flat decimal v. It's the address of v. Then we have to pass in the proper spot. So I think it's just len of d dot bytes dot data. <laughs> feels pretty weird. AKA just pass in the whole thing. We don't need to do anything weird. We just do, we just just say that. So actually, that is like way less complicated than I made it sound. Um, let's whatever this thing is, we need to do it. Um, we don't even need to use flat decimal len. All of that was a waste of time. Wow, I feel pretty dumb right now, but that's okay. So we say d dot bytes dot max at index is equal to d dot len. Then we say d dot bytes dot offsets is equal to append d dot bytes dot offsets int int thirty two of len of d dot. I don't even need to. I keep forgetting. I don't need to kind of re. Um, I don't need to say bytes because we've embedded the bytes thing. Okay, so that was extremely straightforward. I just like wasted a bunch of time doing it for some reason. <laughs> okay. Well, so let's go back to overload space and see what's next. So this one should work, okay. I guess we just need to search for special cases for the, the decimal world. family. Thanks for the follow, Arson, 1996.3. So I think here it's the same thing. We just wanna use types.decimal family. And then I guess we've gotta implement copy slice, uh, which should be presumably exactly the same as it is for bytes, right? Why don't we take a look at what copy slice does on this flat bytes thing? Now I think we can just delegate. We have to re-implement it because the types are different, but we just delegate. So we're gonna say func v decimals copy slice, um, and it needs to take this basic looking signature. Instead of taking source of bytes, it takes source of decimals, um, and then we literally just call d dot bytes dot copy slice. Now here we do have to say bytes because otherwise we'd have a loop. Copy slice, we pass in our source dot bytes. Now, does it make sense to store this as a pointer? I feel like it doesn't. I feel like what we wanna do is store it flat and then change all of these ones to be pointer accessors, just like, uh, like we do in the bytes one. I think that makes more sense. Anyway, uh, so this 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 guy's got to be a pointer. So it's got to be a pointer. Got to be a pointer. And this one's got to take the address of source dot bytes. Okay. So we'll say copy slice source bytes dest idx source start idx source and idx. Okay. So then we got to change this to say given apd dot decimal. Well, it's not really. Oh wait a minute, this is copy slice. We need to get the. Should I just copy this whole doc? I'll just say um, see the comment on bytes dot copy slice 
for more information. So that way we don't have to repeat this enormous comment. Okay. Well, at this point, I do think that we are likely to be able to, okay, well, this isn't quite right either. I think this one's gotta be the same as bytes or something, something very similar to it. Okay, what the heck is going on with this? Copy val, dest and source. Oh, this is, oh, I think this is the same, maybe. I think this one we can keep the same. Because these are, these are operating on scalars and not, uh, I do think that this is dangerous. I think that we're going to get into big, big, bad trouble here because this is where we end up potentially mutating the data inside of our big byte slices. So we've got to be extremely careful. Um, and I'm pretty sure that probably doing nothing here will cause problems, but let's just remember this and then uh, <laughs> we can come back. Okay, this is going to be good. So Brohanser has customized a comment with a single word known as flummoxed. So I've now got the challenge of figuring out how we can introduce the word flummoxed into a code comment related to what I'm working on here. I think this is also going to be extremely easy. <laughs> I think basically what we do <laughs> I think basically what we do <laughs> Dates are pretty okay. What's up? I'm not Michael. Bewildered or perplexed? Okay, let me give you a let me give let me give you guys a um let me give you guys a brief summary of what we're working on since I think a bunch of people have probably joined since the last time I, I explained it. We're working on um changing the representation of decimal columns in CockroachDB, so the in-memory representation of arbitrary precision decimals um, to be flat, so containing no heap pointers. Previously, a column of decimals contains one heap pointer per decimal meaning that to do arithmetic operations on the whole column, you have to do one heap access per element, which is expensive because jumping into the heap requires, uh, it's often not cache local. So uh, as a result, we are unhappy and slow. And the, the project that we're working on now is changing the decimals column representation to be instead a flat bytes representation so that at any given time, even though decimals are sort of variably lengthed, um, you can have the entire decimal in the same like cache local memory area as the ones that are next to it in the column, if that makes any sense. It's kind of the summary of what we're doing, everybody. <laughs> okay, so now we just gotta figure out how to introduce the word flummoxed into this thing. And I think basically what we need to do, since, since uh, you, could, you could probably call what happens when the runtime uh, reads off of the end of a slice, I think it would get pretty flummoxed if it tried to read off of the end of a slice. In fact, it would crash. So presumably all we have to do is figure out a way to claim that one of these, uh, to, to, to explain that um, we do something to avoid the runtime getting flummoxed about running off of the end of a byte slice, right? Seems pretty good. What about this one? Get the number of bytes that we'll need to reserve space for to store the entire coefficient of the decimal. If we don't, <laughs> um, we we need to reserve space <laughs> um, for the coefficient in one big in in a single go, or else in a single go. I'll say all at once, all at once to prevent the runtime from getting flummoxed <laughs> when it attempts to write bytes at fixed values, at fixed indexes within the slice it's sent to. And and it's it's given, not sent to, it's given. It's not the runtime, it's really, it's to prevent the, um, 
times two. into and it attempts to copy too many bytes. <laughs> oh God, this is tough. It's not as easy as I thought. It's not as easy as I thought. Um, <laughs> flummoxed by running off the end of the slice it's handed. Well, we've tried. Um, I think that if these comments pass code review, <laughs> then, um, well, I don't know what you get. You get an extra prize. I don't think that the, the channel points reward guarantees that these will get past code review. I'll just say that. <laughs> okay. So coming back to, I think what we're ready to do now is recompile our generated code to see if things sort of work at this point, and then we can run some tests. I'm expecting things will like go horribly and crash. I'm hoping they'll go horribly and crash because uh, if they don't, I'll be nervous that uh, there are lurking hidden bugs and I'll have to spend more time rooting them out. Because I, I think that there's gonna be memory aliasing problems with this. I'm like 90% sure. We're going to need to dive into some of the implementations of the like arithmetic operators to see what they do um, and how. Because really what I'm nervous about is like, how do we copy the, like how do we do, like somebody was talking about this earlier in the chat. Um, what happens when we try to add two decimals together? If we end up writing, it's like if you have two arbitrary precision decimals, you need space to potentially extend the digits in the arbitrary precision decimal. And in fact, and you, you also don't want to like overwrite the bytes of the first arbitrary precision decimal, which you want to keep immutable. So the question is really like, how can we ensure that we're not aliasing memory that's supposed to stay um, unchanged? Given the fact that we like inflate these APD decimal things with like raw pointers into backing arrays that shouldn't be changed. It's a bit, bit nerve wracking, but we've recompiled our generated code. Let's see if it is valid. We're not. It appears to be invalid, which is suspicious. What is this case? Um, Oh, I see. This needs to return a star. Um, in which case, uh, so why is this happening though? Two call equal to two call. What what function is this again? This is a uh, append. So oh, this is annoying. There's a couple of like weird pointer type issues here that I've got to solve now. I think what I need to do here. is do something like this.
Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, so just a little bit of pointer jiggery pokery to be done. Now, why is this uh, broken again? I think I think we've just got to figure out what how this append val thing is generated. Um, where did I add flummox? Okay, so here's what I did. Here's what I did. This is extremely suspicious. Get the number of bytes that we'll need to reserve space for to store the entire coefficient of the decimal. We need to reserve space for the coefficient all at once to prevent copy from getting flummoxed by running off the end of the slice it's handed. <laughs> it seems legit, right? It seems super legit. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Well, truth is I don't quite still understand why we're not um, generating this append thing, right? So data let's bank, uh, data banks, data banks. take a look at this template. From Endoven, thank you for the follow. Aha, ooh, this is tricky. This is not so good. We've got some sketchy, sketchy stuff around here. We have all these template ifs for specifically bytes, um, but they need to be changed to also include decimals, which says to me that we've got to make an abstraction. Um, what is vec method? So vec method is set to two vec method, canonical type family width, I see. It returns the method name from the interface it can be used to get the well-typed underlying memory from a vector, I see. So I think what we really wanna do here is make it so that, well, truth is I don't know what to do. I mean, ultimately, Why don't we look at all the different places where we do this and see if we can see some patterns. If eek dot vec. Wait, why isn't this? Um... Oh, capital. If eek dot vec method bytes. Let's just uh, open this in the find window see all of the different places that we're doing this right now. Yeah, I could do that, I agree, but I'm just a little bit wondering whether we could instead refactor this to have like a um, a, a method on vec method itself to say, you know, if eek vec method dot is bytes like, or something like this, true? And then we could implement that thing. Like essentially we would go to vec method here. And this thing, instead of being a string, we'd say type vec method string. And then we could say func v vec method is bytes like bool switch v case decimal bytes <laughs> return true return false and 
And then here we say vec method. Now, is this gonna cause all sorts of problems? I think it might. I think here we probably want to I feel like we're gonna be changing a bunch of types. It might be worth it. it. Might not be worth it. I don't know. Let's just see what happens. Well, maybe that will fix all of it. It's not so bad. So then in my testers here, instead of saying this, we say if dot eek vec method dot. Now, I think there's a way to call arbitrary methods on this, these template worlds, isn't there? Don't I just say dot vec method dot, wait, what was my, is bytes like, is, Byte like turns true if this vec method vec method returns a type slice that is backed by a flat bytes representation. And then I think I can get rid of the eeks. So let's just try to replace all of these, <laughs> get really uh, hopeful. So we'll say if dot vec method dot is bytes like just, oh, I think we need to include this. Okay, place all. All right, well, See where this gets us. <laughs> it could end in tears. It could end in tears. Cannot use two vec method as, okay, I just didn't quite finish uh, replacing all of the, uh... Hello there, Radria Bala. Um, if you hit exclamation point, editor in the chat, it will tell you about that stuff. Okay, rose to vec gen. Yes, I use the Vim plugin um, in Golang. So that's called Idea Vim, and it works in all of the JetBrains editors, like IntelliJ or Golang or PyCharm, stuff like that. So it's just sort of a Vim emulator. It's quite good. Um, it's pretty much it's pretty much all of all of Vim-ish. Without like you can't can't really use Vim script or anything like that. But um, I think it's got quite a bit of the good. The, the stuff that you would really want out of Vim. <laughs> um, need not null. Wait a minute. What am I looking for here? We actually need to search vec method string. There's the last one. Oh wait, no, that is the one. So what's going wrong here then? Executing, oh, eek, vec method is bytes true, true bytes. Oh, I screwed something up here. Um, eek dot vec method. This one just seems pretty broken. I'm not sure why it didn't. 
Oops, we don't even want the eek. I'm not sure what happened there. It's pretty odd. And I guess we've got some more to change. Now that I think about it, we've data got the... Banks, data banks, data banks. All of these ores have to be done properly. Recently started learning VI commands and I found them really useful. You need to practice them more. Definitely. I think that once you once you get those into your muscle memory, oh my gosh, you're just going to be data an banks, editing data God. Banks, data banks. <laughs> Learn one new VI command every three years. Hey, thanks for the follow Swarm Collective. Okay, so here I think instead of saying this stuff, we just say, I guess we can just do this search again. I'm not sure why that didn't work actually. Eek vec method bytes. How come that didn't work? I don't know. Anyway, um, we can replace it with dot vec method dot is bytes like. See what that gets us. Go to next word and delete everything after cursor alone is life changing. Yes. Those are pretty good ones. To be honest, I almost never use go to next word. That's one that I want. I always want to be Are using more. By guessing. But I never really do, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know what I use a lot though, Radria? Is um you might need to do something like dot vec method dot strings so that a string is placed in during template generation. Ooh, yeah, I see what you mean. We'll see though, because I think that vec method is like castable to a string, so it might just work. We'll kind of find out. Well, it didn't work. So whatever I did did not quite work yet. That's kind of a bummer. Um, so let's let's, uh, let's double check here. Pend. It says if dot vec method dot is bytes like. And I'm pretty sure that this is not getting invoked, right? Because otherwise, um, what we would see is this. But what we actually see is. Oh wait. No, so this is working fine. So what's not working is something else. Okay, so we did good here. The next one is something else. This is a different method, it's copy. Okay, so we're, we're making some progress. But yeah, Radria, what I use all the time is instead of, I don't use this WW, but what I do use is the F command, which is absolutely just sweet. So what F does, if you hit F and then a letter, it navigates the next occurrence of that letter in the line. <laughs> I use that complicated, I mean, I mean uh, constantly. Yo, the Mr. Software, I like to contribute to CockroachDB. Do I have any suggestions to start with? Yes, I have some good suggestions for you. Here's what you should do. Go to CockroachDB uh, on GitHub. Go to the issues list. I should make a command for this actually. And then go to labels and then search for good first issue. Wait, this is sort of a dumb way of doing it. But anyway, um, if you go to this link here, you know what I'm gonna do? Commands add good first issue. Um, new contributors, check out the good first issue label on our repo. How about that? So, so check out that link, uh, Mr. Software. Since I haven't used Vim functionality yet, I haven't used buffers yet, but there are some people that say select a SQL query and run with the command. Yeah, that's definitely some cool stuff. Go to definition. All of that is good. All of that is very important. Okay, so for copy, for copy now, what's the deal with copy exactly? And how come it's not working for us? Light arc, if you hit exclamation point editor, you will find out. Um, copy with cell, this thing needs to be fixed, right? Isn't that the issue? Um,
Man, I forget how this stuff works. So what the bytes one does is it says to call dot set. Well, what we're saying is, oh, you know what it is? It's definitely this, uh, it's definitely that other template file called overloads base, right? Yeah. So this has got to be fixed here. Ooh, see, this is, um, wait, wait, no, 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 no. Is that right? I think this is, this is what we've got to change right here. Now this is, it's going to make me nervous because this is back into the world of, uh, aliasing. But I actually think this is going to work out just fine because when, when we say dot set, dot set is supposed to, it actually just overwrites a value at the end of the byte slice. Okay. So I think that we just have to probably re-implement set on top of decimals in a similar way that we did with the pen val, and then we could be good to go. The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the I haven't search. learned Go yet, but when Are I do, I'll try that? to contribute to Cockroach TV. Guessing. Cool. Is there anything you'd recommend for newbies to find cool products that they could con contribute to? I'm familiar with Java, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, and learning a bit of C right now. Um, that's a good question. I think that it's pretty hard to just recommend any random project. What I always recommend is try to follow something that you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in game development. Um, maybe you're interested in system software. Uh, maybe you're interested in you know command line scripts and uh, customization and stuff like that. Try to find something like that that you're interested in. And search on GitHub. Try to see you know projects that are active recently uh, related to those things. And to be honest, when you have a project on GitHub um, and somebody comes along and tries to contribute to it, that usually makes you feel pretty good as the author of a project. So if you can find one of those and you can be nice and you know open an issue or a PR and talk to the person, I think that they're going to appreciate it. Um, so that's my suggestion. Not too concrete, but hope it helps. Hey, Igorovich, thank you for the follow. Okay. So let's go ahead and implement this dot set thing on top of decimal now. I think, um, hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, just as me X U S says, I think if you search for good first issue, like there's this label that has, um, spaces in it. I think that one on GitHub is pretty popular for projects that are looking for new contributors. I mean, it definitely, de yeah, it depends on the code base for sure. I think Nate is right. Uh, you should definitely check out, you know, what it's sort of like in the repo or something, but if it's just a small project, you know, people are going to feel feel pretty good. They'll, they'll definitely respond to you one way or another. Um, anyway. Okay. So let us go ahead. You know, I have to say that this function has a striking similarity to append val, you know, it appears to be almost identical to append val. And I wonder if we could share the code there. Um, but you know, I'm just not going to bother. I'm just going to sort of do the same thing we did before and copy it for now. Now this is also going to take a V A P D dot decimal. Okay. Now there's something that is bad. I'm just realizing, which is that I've got to set D dot data back to the result of this thing or else we're going to get into bad trouble. Since we modify that D dot data slice, if we don't, well, we don't modify, but we, we append to it and appending to something in go, it might reallocate the, the slice, which means that, uh, unless you get that value back, you're going to be looking at an old abandoned copy of things, which is never good. 
Never good. Okay, so we've got our dot set method. So now what we've got to do is go back to our template to our overloads base and add our decimal family into this list. Get rid of this special case and then we're good to go. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and re exec gen, see what happens, see what's up. Don't forget to update the message on line 46. Uh, you have a sharp eye. I wonder what, um, oh, I see what you mean. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very good eye, Swarm Collective. You got a gold star. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and check out how our generated code is doing. Okay, so that's good. We've fixed the problems down here and it looks like there's one more problem left, which has to do with this window function, which I've never understood exactly. Um, but we can try to figure it out together. Um, and I think what we have to do here, it's pretty similar to what we did before. Let's go to where we do our windowing. What's up, Chupala? Hi, Trollis. Now, if, my friend Chupala, if you are coming into this channel to be a Trollette yourself, just watch out. We don't tolerate that sort of behavior. <laughs> so we've got this exec gen window guy, which means that there's probably an implementation inside of overloads base. And same thing, we've just got to add our types.decimal family here and implement window, and then we should be good to go. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's, we also should copy our doc string for set like this. Okay. So now we get to do our special window machine which truthfully, truthfully, I don't understand how that thing works, but that is just completely okay because we're going to basically copy it and we can learn. Maybe the doc string will help us understand. Okay, so window creates a window into the receiver, in quotes. It behaves similarly to Golang slice, but the returned object is not allowed to be modified. It is read only. Window is a lightweight operation that doesn't involve copying the underlying data. I see, very cool. Very cool. Very important that we do not mutate these return slices with any kind of mistakes with this representation, which I'm definitely nervous about that, you guys. I'm not gonna lie. Definitely nervous about it, but we'll just have to run the tests and see how things go. <clears throat> um... Okay. Um, so we're going to return a new decimals and that's going to contain a bytes. And that's going to contain this stuff. I think basically, <laughs> oh, you know, maybe this is a good place where we can actually delegate to the underlying bytes. So we can say d.bytes.window. No, unfortunately that returns a pointer to a bytes, which is sort of pointless. Kind of says to me that we should get a non pointer version of window that we can share over here. Um, Cause otherwise, 
um, we're just going to be wasting some allocation. So let's let's go over here um, and we'll make another function func b bytes. We want to export this one. We'll call it um, new new window make window new. Okay, so this way, um, over here in our decimal dot go, we can just say window is equal to d dot bytes dot window, new window rather, start end. Then we can kind of just do all this delegation like this. Okay. What's up, I like recursion? Welcome to the stream. I like recursion too. <laughs> All right. Hey, Nikon, how's it going? Nice to see you. Um, I'm not working on the Go compiler, no. This is uh, the source code for CockroachDB, a distributed database. Uh, yes, it is not Rust. It is, in fact, Go. How did, why did you think it was Rust? It doesn't look very Rust-like to me. Okay, so let's regenerate our generated code here, see what happens for us. You only write Erlang? That's cool. I want to I want to get into Erlang a little bit more. Um, Erlang is not a language I've played with too much, but I like it conceptually quite a bit. I did a little bit of like actor model related stuff at one point, like a few years ago, kind of a kind of like a lot of years ago at this point. Um, but I was doing it in Scala, <laughs> um, and Scala is sort of yeah. I mean Scala is its own thing, but I want to see the original the OG actor model. I think that would be cool. Um, so do you do, uh, just Erlang or also Elixir? I hear Elixir is really popular. While you wait for a compilation, can you show the result of the onto the byte thing? Um, the data bank's too you'll have to say more blind banana. I, have I don't to narrow quite down follow. The search. How are you going to do that? By guessing. Okay. Let's see. Where we're at here. Wait, what? I should say C. Um, nice. Okay, so our generated VEC code is compiling, which is exciting. Um, benefit of using Scala, what does it have that other languages don't? I think it's kind of like a functional programming language that lives on top of the JVM. So it's sort of like Haskell or standard ML a little bit, um, but it lives on JVM. So it's pretty powerful. I think it's it's got a lot of potential for abstractions, but I also think it's, a, it's I think people consider it a little bit inscrutable sometimes, hard to, hard to read. Um, and it's, I think it's just got a lot of language features. So some people like big languages, some people don't, but I think that's kind of what it's like. Try to like but mostly old stuff. You were trying to represent big int decimal into a byte. Okay, uh, blind banana, yes. So faffing about, wow, how rude. How terribly rude. I will never forgive you for calling me a faff. So basically, uh, it looks like this. Um, we did figure out the end in this. It's not that complicated. We sort of just uh, iterate through the decimal. We get a bunch of information from it. We sort of blit it out into a byte slice and then return the byte slice. It's not, I mean, it's basically pretty straightforward. It was just a bunch of details to figure out. Um, can you suggest some activities to do to, in order to tackle open source projects? I think we were talking about this earlier. I think Rootnox, to be honest, what you need to do is figure out something that you're really interested in. Um, maybe that's game development or, you know, your, the, your prompt, 
uh, or you know command line tools or system stuff and try to find a project that uh, is on GitHub that is related to that thing. So I think we're at, a lot of people get their get their start in programming and open source is just customizing the tools that they already use. You know, like you know your shell, or your chat client, or your mail client, and trying to customize those things to your liking. I think those are those are pretty good ways to get started with open source. Scala has a lot of functional components, but it does get confusing. This diagram always gets me a little scared. Okay, we got to see what this is. Well, this is just a type hierarchy, right? I mean, this is a little scary, I guess, but I think any language with a robust collections library would have something like this. Uh, I guess it's a little scary, but it doesn't seem that bad. I, I don't know. I think that this this kind of makes sense. Um, we'd like to know your opinion about concurrent in Go compared to Erlang. Yeah, so concurrency in Go is it's um, pretty straightforward. Um, they like to use this sort of Go routine or green threads model where in order to make a new thread, you kind of pass a function into this special keyword called Go and that runs it in a separate Go routine. Um, and Besides that, um, everything is sort of just sort of typical Computers shared memory over style, a thousand data banks um, the where world. you know if you want to use an object between two Go routines, you can go ahead and do that. The runtime won't stop you, but um, you know you've got to make sure to lock it uh, to deal with any concurrency issues. They they also encourage the use of these things called channels, um, which I think is the sort of CSP or whatever. Uh, isn't that what CSP is about? Channels? I don't know. Anyway, so a channel is kind of just a queue. A thread safe queue that you can send stuff um, on and receive stuff from. And people sometimes will communicate between Go routines and channels. Um, I think it's pretty nice. It's pretty straightforward. I think the nice thing about Go um, in general and concurrency is no different is that it's it's very simple. Like the number of different things that you can do with these primitives is fairly low. So um, it kind of gives you this very sort of crisp blade with which to do everything. Um, and that makes it, once you sort of learn that one blade, you you are just as powerful as anybody else who knows the blade. Con contrasted with something like Scala, where there are like a million ways to do anything, I think that can be overwhelming for beginners. Um, and I think, I think in general, honestly, Go is a really good language for you know relative beginners. Um, after they've got their fundamentals of programming down, I think it's a really good language for doing, you know, uh, programming that should be systems level or efficient or what have you. <clears throat> uh, you're welcome, Root Knox. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what happens when we run our tests again. I, I, I'm guessing things are still not gonna completely compile, but uh, we'll see. Hey, Haritok, nice to see you. You barred Git last. Oh, that's awesome. I love Git last. That's one of my favorites. Okay, so still some issues here. Arrow batch converter has not been fixed yet. Oh, this makes sense. It's because it's um not generated code. So I think what we'll do here, probably just copy what we do in the bytes builder here. We can probably make this more efficient. Hmm. See, now this is getting into, okay. So I think what we could do theoretically is like sort of send out, <laughs> sort of do the same thing that we're doing with bytes format, which is to just turn it into a network serialized thing. But then we have to worry about endianness, right? Like we, earlier we were like, okay, we'll just use the machine native endianness. But then if you run, you know, a cockroach DB cluster with, uh, machines that have different endianness. Not that I advise doing that. I'm not sure if it would even work, but then that would completely break everything. So we have to come back to that. For now, I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, kind of do exactly what we do here in a loop. So it'll be a little bit less efficient than it was before probably, but that's probably fine. It's just sort of for now. So we'll say for i in range vec dot, uh, for i equals zero, i less than vec dot decimal dot. Let's pull this out into a variable actually. Okay, so decimals, decimals dot len i plus plus, we'll say d is equal to decimals dot get of i. 
the end. And then I guess over here, we've got to figure out how to deal with this problem. I guess we can say vec r dot append val. Bar decimal. So what this code is doing, by the way, um, <laughs> it's kind of random, but it's it's uh, basically serializing columns of data into bytes for uh, sending over the network between nodes in a distributed SQL query. Um, so I think this would be a great opportunity to be more efficient than what we're doing right now and to just send that those sort of flat bytes like we've been talking about. But I'm going to avoid doing that for now just to keep this experiment a little bit tighter. Try to get things working before we go too crazy. Um, what is wrong with this? Far decimal apd dot decimal. Uh, why isn't this working exactly? Seems like it's not. Weird. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. So we'll say if error is equal to d dot unmarshal text. And then we're going to pass this whole thing in here. In fact, we can probably just copy it like this, return error. We've got our D. Then we say vec r dot append val D, right? Seems legit. <clears throat> and let's, uh, let's try again. See what's next. All right, just a couple more things to solve. We're just going to be playing a little whack-a-mole until we're done with this. There is a finite number of moles to whack, though, luckily. I, I assure you. Okay, what is this, though? <clears throat> well, I guess it's just using set. And I suppose in this case, well, pretty straightforward, actually. Okay, so what is this about? Get decimal into. Kind of seems like what we want to do is say. Kind of want to. I think we just want to say var d apd decimal. Get decimal into, pass in the, pass in the d. Then we say vec dot decimal dot set of idxd, right? No problem. Okay, so that's that. We're gonna do value encoding. Value encoding. So what these functions are, by the way, um, these are very important functions. These are functions that take the encoded byte. So <laughs> I feel like we've been talking about a lot of different kinds of encoded bytes, but these two, the key encoding and the value encoding, are the disk encoded formats of decimals in CockroachDB. So this is about um, how we store um, uh, decimals inside of what we call values, which are like the... Um, so if you imagine a SQL index, right? There's like something that you're indexing and something that you're pointing the index to. The thing that you're pointing the index to is called a value and the thing that you're indexing is called a key. <clears throat> So here I think it's the same thing. We say var d apd decimal decode into untagged decimal value, pass in d. Then we say vec dot decimal dot set. Whoop, yeah, dot set idx comma d. And here we have the same weird import problem. I don't know what the deal is with that. Cockroach labs lol. What is that supposed to mean? I like recursion. Come at me, bro. Fight me about Cockroach Labs, the name. 
I've had this the fight before, and I'll have big. it again. I have to narrow down the search. How are you gonna do that? By guessing. All right, so a few more of these. Vec to datum. Vec to datum. This needs to be updated, I think. But that's a little bit confusing. So let's see. Vec to datum. Pg.go. What is the problem here? It says that. Databanks, databanks, databanks. Call vec to datum and deselect. Hey, Joker Dan and Memo Kurt, thank you for the follows. Do you think half a gigabyte for a Docker image would be enough for a simple API? Um, you mean half a gigabyte for the disk space of the Docker image or half a gigabyte of memory to run the Docker image? And also what Docker image are you talking about? Um, I think the answer is maybe, but I don't know. For the RAM? And and what are, what would you be trying to run in your Docker image? Like some like an API server that you're writing? Is that the idea? Ah, this is probably the thing that we've got to fix now. Right? Definitely. Okay, so Mm. Computers this is definitely one of the most sketchy parts of this whole situation, not going to lie. Hey, I'm not Maiko. Thank you for the follow. Does Cockroach DB store arbitrary length values similar to our DBMS systems, which set aside pages to store the data? and put a pointer on the record itself or arbitrary length values in line with fixed length values? That is a good question, Swarm Collective. Um, the answer is that the in, um, in the on-disk encoding, um, we end up just delegating to uh, our key value store to do the storage. So in other words, we don't do any kind of playing around with um, having separate pages for varlin data or anything like that we sort of store here i'll give you an example very quick example won't spend too long on it i'm going to say create table a a and primary key b string so if i were to say insert into a values one foo and this this foo thing is a sort of var length item right um what this looks like under the hood um is like a, a key value pair that's sort of pointing well, it's gonna have a key that looks like the table ID of the table plus the index ID of the index um, plus this number one, which is the key. And this is gonna point out a big old string called foo. And that's kind of what it looks like from the perspective of a key value store. You could think of like, you know, Cassandra storing this under the hood or Dynamo or anything. Any any old key value store would work. We use Pebble, but it would theoretically, you could imagine the SQL layer of CockroachDB pushing down into any old key value store. And in fact, you can demonstrate this if I say set auto trace equals on comma kv and then i say select star from a you can actually see that in this log line here um, you can see what actually gets fetched so to speak by the key value store and you can see just as i said there's a key that sort of goes from a primary it's not actually started like this it's just sort of shorthand so you can read it easier uh, but the key looks like you know one and then it points to foo over here so that's kind of the idea, if that makes sense. So there's no like off heap storage or anything like that, the way Postgres does um, the toast columns. We want to figure out a way to do big columns because that's honestly a big problem. We have like sort of a fixed, we, we, we if your values are bigger than like a couple of megabytes, we get into trouble. Um, we don't really have a solution for that right now, but we'd like to find one. <clears throat> Resources for learning about how databases are implemented. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of things that you would want to learn about the world. if you want to learn about how databases are implemented. There is a pretty good recent book called, I think it's called like Databass, Databass book, this thing. This is a recent book that's pretty good. Um, it's kind of classical in a sense. It talks about B-tree storage. Um, 
uh, more than data bags, data bags, data things bags. like... Well, I guess it does talk about LSM trees, huh? But anyway, I think this is a good book. You should check it out. That's a flounder. <laughs> that is suspicious. Hey, thanks for the follows. Uh, no good Nick and I like recursion. Okay. Um, so, coming back to what the heck is going on with this thing. Safe, what's up? Safe, 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 safe. There we go, saying it right. Nice to see you. Fundamentals of Database Systems by Al Masri is the one we used to use at my uni. It's really old, but it has good info technical overview without code. I think I've heard of that book. I think I've heard of that book. Say what we're working on right now, we're working on storing decimals in a flat bytes representation for efficiency. <laughs> Okay, so let us figure out what the heck is going on with this. Let, why don't we look at the normal code so we can understand what it's supposed to do instead of looking at this um, template stuff. Root guy, um, good joke. I think what we wanna say here See, look at how it's doing something very specific. What What is this code doing? Call vec to datum and deselect. Oh, you know, this is actually good. Remember how I was, I was nervous about, um, I was nervous about memory aliasing. It looks like we already have thought about this and we clear, we, we like, when we convert out at the edges, so to speak, of the flat bytes representation, we already have a step where we can make a copy and store it as a fresh immutable datum. So I think this is encouraging to me. Large Spider says, why not store decimals as hexadecimal values? Why not store decimals as hexadecimal values? I mean, in a sense, Large Spider, that is what we're doing. <laughs> so an arbitrary precision decimal is a var variably length quantity because it can be of any precision. You know, you can store a decimal that has a thousand zeros and then a two at the end. Um, and that would be a very precise, you know, 0 0.00002 or whatever. I um, mean, in a sense, we do store them as sort of uh, a bytes representation of all of those zeros. So, well, in that case, actually, we would store it just as two and then we would have a big exponent, but you get the idea. The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do um, that? So I think By for guessing. this, honestly, what we just need to do is change this to say .get of source IDX instead of just indexing directly into it. And then, well, I think we should pull this out to its own variable. Can't be called the. Um, call it v. <laughs> and we'll say, coef.set v.coef. Maybe the address of v.coef. Plus that's, that's, just, that's not so bad. It's not so bad. There's more things to fix. Oh, those are just all of the implementations of these things. So I think if I just change this template, it will probably kind of fix itself. Now we just have to figure out how the heck this template works. So I guess uh, first thing is we pull out V before the this part. So we're gonna go like this, right? Say V equals typed call. Now typed call I think is gonna be this two thing. I would like to try some object-oriented language. Does Go support object orientation? I really cannot tell. I would say like kind of. Go has like medium support for object-oriented style. Um, it's not. It doesn't have the like pure uh, 
In fact, I would say that it doesn't exactly it doesn't exactly have support for object oriented. You have you can put methods on structs and you can kind of inherit methods from other structs, but it isn't the same as Java because you can't call an interface. You you can't like associate a, an object with an interface um, by saying it implements that interface. It's a little bit different. So you end up not not being able to do the like inheritance basic inheritance stuff that you can in Java. I don't know. I'm kind of being imprecise. I haven't used Java in a little while, so I forget exactly the way to phrase this stuff. But I would say if you're looking to start with like a classic OO language, I wouldn't start with Go. I would maybe look at Java or I mean, even Python, I, I think has, well, Python's got limitations too, right? You can do abstract base classes in Python, but it's sort of hacky. I feel like if you really want a true OO experience, you probably want to use use Java. <laughs> so maybe somebody could correct me. I feel like that wasn't exactly right. Oh, C sharp. That's right. Yeah. How could I forget about C sharp? I've never really used it. So that's the reason I didn't suggest it, but, um, don't you have to be like kind of on windows to do C sharp C sharp? Oh yeah, and C++, obviously. Well, I didn't recommend C++ because I've never used that thing either, really. <laughs> I use it like in college a little bit, never figured it out. Sometimes I just forget that it exists. Microsoft literally made something called .NET Core, which compiles for Linux as well. Oh, okay, that's cool. Kind of a pain in the butt right now because every library has a .NET Core and a .NET Framework version. Oh, really? So you can't just, they don't sort of interoperate? <clears throat> data banks, data banks, data banks. Um. What is happening with this? Hey, thanks for the follow constant coder. <clears throat> All right, more whack-a-mole, more whack-a-mole to play here. They provide a standard which defines the base classes that could be available. Oh yeah, Xamarin. What is that Xamarin? I've seen that thing around, but I don't know what it means. .NET 5 tries to combine .NET standard and core. There still isn't a cross-platform UI library. That makes sense. Xamarin is for mobile. I see. Very cool. Uh, 
Okay. We're making progress. We've still, okay, so hash any not null. This probably means we just didn't finish one of the templates for some reason. Um, data bags, data bags, data exactly. bags. Yo, large spider, thanks for that follow. Appreciate it. Hmm. Okay, so let's uh hash any not null. Any not null ag template. I'm Mr. Roboto. Do I have a tip for you, my friend? I wrote a blog post about this. It, it is exactly targeted at what you're asking about. So I'm very pleased to, to be able to uh, share this with you uh, without feeling like I'm just tooting my own horn. Here's the blog post I wrote about your question. <laughs> okay, so template type, I believe, is now probably slight issue, isn't it? I should add a command for that link. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, what it should be like setup or something? Uh, live coding, maybe? Commands add live coding. Here's a post I wrote about how to get started live coding on Twitch. And I guess I could make one. Well, whatever. Okay, so um, let's see here. I think fundamentally the issue here is that this thing needs to be a pointer. This thing needs to be a pointer. So go type slice is set wrong. um for decimal so go go type slice name where do we set this stuff up again aha okay so this has to have it's got to have a star very subtle very very subtle let us regenerate <clears throat> just do it <laughs> i think that's a good uh methodology it does take it's a little bit you've got to do some things I think the data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do that? By guessing. Hey, uh, Lassa. I don't actually know how to pronounce your name, but I saw you uh, were, yeah, saw your situation. Going to be joining the team uh, next year. So super excited about that. Thanks for the follow here on Twitch. But I, I'm afraid I don't know how to say your name there. So sorry if I mispronounced it. I got it right the first time. Okay, that's great. Um, cool. Well, yeah, it's very, very exciting. Um, looking forward to uh, working with you at one point. Um, VS Code, so I actually use um, Goland, but if you type exclamation point theme, then you will be able to see that information. Um, okay, so let's see if that uh, fixed anything. Rodri, oh, I said Rodria, I see, Rodri Avila, very cool. Um, 30 minutes trying to figure out some Angular component was undefined only to, dang, hair talk, that sounds pretty annoying. Uh, yeah, Large Spider, we're kind of like uh, Twitch brothers in a sense. Okay, so we're making some progress here, but we still have a little bit of stuff to do. I think, oh, this is kind of a weird problem, isn't it? The computer's hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Hey, Data Goose, thank you for the follow there. Data Goose. Okay, so basically what we did earlier, this code is, you guys, I'm not gonna lie, this code is pretty hard to understand, but this is template code that tries to generate a type-specific aggregation for all the different types in the database. Um, and I think what we did earlier is we were sort of optimistic. We said, anytime that we have a switch specific for bytes slices for aggregates, we could instead switch to this new method that we added called uh, is bytes like, right? So we've, we've been adding this sort of capability to represent a decimal 
column like a bytes column. That's the whole point of this project. And we thought that maybe we could just represent all of the places where we check for bytes with is bytes like, but this is not one of those because what this is doing is checking for the length of a particular, the current thing that we're aggregating, I guess. And what is the point of this exactly? Is it for, I see. Yeah, so it's, it's basically to keep track of the memory that we're using for this aggregate, which makes sense. So I think what we'll have to do, we'll probably have to adjust this. And I'm a little nervous we'll have to do it in a lot of places. Why don't we search for what we changed here? If dot vec method dot is, whoops. If dot vec method dot is bytes like. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of these ones where we're kind of, it's kind of annoying actually. The computer's hooked into over a thousand data banks little bit of the a, world. A little bit of a problem. Hey, the Rob White, thanks for the, the follow there. Um, Kind of feeling like what we really want is a way to I mean we kind of need like a type specific like length or size method, something like that. Um, just how we have down here, we can, you know, if we have this sort of datum thing, which again is sort of the fallback um, data type for data types that are not supported natively by the vectorize execution engine, we can actually just use this dot size method, which is implemented, you know, as an ordinary method on all of the datum types. Um, but the whole point of the vectorize engine is that we avoid having these kind of interface switches. That's one of the big advantages. And so we, that's why we have this template code that does different things depending on the type. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that it kind of feels like it might be about time to figure out a templated way of getting the size of a particular var length data type or something like that. I don't know. I mean, to be honest, what I'm probably going to do right now is um, just have a more complicated um, if condition here. So essentially I'll say, I'll just, I'll just kind of have an else if, ugh, doesn't make me particularly happy though. Um, does this thing, does this, I forget how this works. Uh, go text template. Do we have else ifs in this thing or is it just kind of ifs and end ifs? If we do have sort of an else if, right? Okay, so we can actually replace this with an else if, we can replace this with an else if, and uh, the else if here is just gonna be back method is equal to decimals. <clears throat> and then uh, in order to figure out the size of a decimal, I guess what we're gonna do is this like encoded byte size thing. What it, this is what we did earlier. So flat decimal, encode flat decimal, flat decimal len, right? So this is, this is our special function. I don't exactly, well, you know what we could do is we could actually even make this thing a method on APD decimal. Well, this thing doesn't really have a, Nah, forget that. Okay, I'll just kind of stick with, the, with this idea because we don't, changing APD decimal requires, it's like an upstream library and stuff like that. So that would take a lot of effort. So we'll just say else if eek vec method decimals, we'll say old ag, old cur ag size is equal to uh, encoding dot flat decimal len of a dot cur ag, something like that, right? Um, and for my generated code, this is a, okay, so it's actually a pointer of that thing or the address of that thing. Okay, so I guess we kind of have to do that like a bunch of different spots, unfortunately, right? All of these aggregate areas, we've got to do the same. Uh... Uh, it's not particularly happy. Not gonna lie, this is annoying. Um, well, I guess I'll just kind of clone this stuff. Um, I 
new cur egg size. Um, okay, well, that's completely disgusting, but I guess it's fine. Okay, so uh, moving on. <laughs> uh, moving on, we have to do exactly the same thing to all of these. Man, it really feels like we should be able to factor some of this thing out, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Sure does. But now is not the time. Now is not the time. I think we'll just kind of copy this over here. Um, okay. And then I think we can probably do the same thing to Oh, is it just two things? Oh, you guys, it's not that bad. It's just two files. It's just two files. Whew. I was like getting freaked out that we'd have to do it for every single aggregate. But it looks like somehow it's just two files. Um, so that is a good thing. Um, and this should really say, not as by its like, but uh, wait a minute. This has got to say this one. Um, what's up, World Wake? Okay, this is like the worst, this is the worst. I'm not gonna lie, this is really quite the worst. I feel like I'm also saying I'm not gonna lie a lot because I'm embarrassed about this kind of area. <laughs> uh, but that is okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's regenerate the code. Let's hopefully, let's just like pretend we didn't do that and regenerate our generated code and see if the that- The databank's too big. I have to narrow wow. down the search. Are Love to see the uh, By guessing. skipping alerts when the computer is compiling. But thank you for the follow, Fedidito. Fedidito. <laughs> hey, Yor, I didn't realize you were still here. But yeah, exactly how I feel um, about that. <laughs> about that situation. Now is not the time. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, did we manage to fix all these issues? Not quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, why is that? Is it supposed to say decimal? Decimals, decimal. Any not null decimal hash ag. Any not null. Else if eek vec method decimals. What's the prob? What is the prob with that? Decimal, it's singular, dude. Now, truly brutal. Truly brutal. Uh, I'm still just trying to hold my nose here. Let's just not, let's not worry too much about this problem. <laughs> just not worry too much about this problem. If we worry about it, we're gonna enter a sad world. Okay, regenerate the code, we'll try again.
Okay. Well, did we succeed this time? Seems like we still missed, we still missed something, huh? We sure did. We still missed one last, oh man, this is pretty frustrating, isn't it? Okay. Um, And presumably we'll have to do this exact same thing in the min max gen, won't we? Won't we? All right. Battle says, when am I going to upgrade my keyboard and get a data hand like a real man? I would love to have a data hand. That thing looks absolutely ridiculous. And I could, I be, could be typing like this, right? Those things, I mean, those things are like antiques, right? Do you guys know about data hands? Data hand. Look at this. What the heck? Steve Cohen has one? Who's Steve Cohen? Like, what? Is this a joke? Is this a joke to you? I feel like it would probably, I mean, look, to be honest, if you like, like having to type by moving your finger upwards seems extremely unergonomic to me. That like is not a natural motion for the hand, I don't think. Up, up, up. It's, your fingers are better going downwards, aren't they? Okay. Did we do it? Are we out of this terrible template issue? Almost. <laughs> uh, almost. Finger up is hard enough, then you have to side to side. Yeah, that's a good point. He's a dev, pretty active in Elixir and other stuff. He's at Discord now. Okay, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, looks like we forgot that we also have to clear, we have to teach this thing how to eagerly release the memory of the aggregated object. <laughs> um, so, Um, I think, I guess what we should do here, presumably, this is nasty, man. We need to like figure out a way to abstract all of this stuff out. We have to find a way. You know what you should do, Vettel, if you really want to get into the world of trying crazy keyboards, is that you should try to find, I mean, I don't know if this works in COVID land anymore, but you should try to find a keyboard meetup. Because <laughs> at a keyboard meetup, you can go and try out all these crazy keyboards. Um which would be a good way for you to try this stuff. So if it's a- The data bank's too big. I have to narrow down Elianov, the search. Elianov, thank you for the How follow. Do that? I'm sorry about I that stuttering. It. That's pretty annoying. Pretty annoying. All right, we're just gonna switch the way this this stuff works a little bit. Uh, 
Not a bad idea. I was tempted to buy an Ergo Docs, but it's also a scary buy for the money. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Nikon, we have a lot of these kinds of abstractions, but there's certain special cases that we have because we just haven't figured out a way to abstract out these problems. It's it's a terrible mess, I would say. <laughs> I am also surprised by it. It's, I think basically it's like, for the more common things that we have to do, we do have a kind of abstraction in this template language. Um, and then when it comes to things that are very uncommon, like these two templates, just the any not null and min max ags, we haven't bothered to make the abstraction that we should have. I think it's pretty bad. Um, and that's why, I mean, it just takes so much effort to change this stuff. The data bank's see. too big. I have to narrow down the um, search. How are you gonna do that? By guessing. Makes me pretty, pretty sad. Stormic, thanks for the follow. I guess like ideally what we could do is we would have an exec gen dot um, get memory size or something. Thing is that like the, the reason that we have an if here at all is that you need different things if you're a varlen data type, I think. And I think that that makes things a little bit tricky, maybe. I don't know. Time to port to everything to Haskell. That'll solve everything. I do think that having a language with better generic support would help us quite a lot. I think uh, a lot of the trouble here is just caused by the fact that we don't have any any generics. But that's why we're doing all this template stuff in the first place. It's because Go doesn't have a good template or generic language like we've talked about. Yes, I mean, Go2 will likely help us quite a bit, but it won't even solve everything, right? I think there's going to be a lot of things that are still pretty horrible. Um, because it doesn't let you do template specialization in GoTo. Um, GoTo, <laughs> GoTo does have GoTo support. Go and GoTo both have GoTo support, for sure. Believe it or not, I can write GoTo code in here. It's just not. I think it's just like local to your function or something like that. You can't do like arbitrary go-tos. Okay, uh, so what am I trying to do here? Um, basically, I just want this, I want this, this is data, and then we do some other stuff. And I guess here we're going to say equals APD dot decimal, something like this. And I think we'll want to copy this same thing to our other, whoops, yes. I want to copy this thing to our any not null area. And I hope that this will be the end of things. Every language has its pros and cons. That is absolutely true. All right, I'm really hoping we'll be done with these aggregates soon. <laughs> I'm getting pretty tired of them. I really wanna see if we can do an end-to-end -end test before we end the stream. I think we should be able to, to be honest. I think we're getting really close. Okay, nice. We managed to compile the weird aggregates. Let's uh, see what happens when we run the test. Presumably there will still be some more straggling, but oh boy. Okay, so we've got a few more things to fix, huh? <laughs> um, um, okay, so more aggregate stuff. Kind of makes me wonder. Kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? The issue is that... Oh! Uh, it just looks like, um... oh, this is actually interesting. Okay, so this is actually very interesting. 
Uh, the issue is that for all of the average aggregates, we hard code the output as an APD decimal column because all averages are sort of by definition, arbitrary precision decimal operations. So I guess that just means we've got to change that hard coded data type. I think that makes sense. That's not so bad. So average aggregate template. Um, presumably somewhere we've just got a, hmm. Ret go type. Hmm. Oh, interesting. No, actually it looks like sometimes the output is a decimal type and sometimes it's a float type. Uh, so that's cool. <laughs> I think these aggregates are probably the trickiest templated code that we've got, to be honest. So kind of feels like what we're going to need to do is something a little bit sad, which is to even introduce an even second level template into this, which is that I think at the moment we overload the ret go type to mean both the intermediate aggregate type. So in other words, so here's the thing we're doing, right? We're, we're doing an a sum into this APT decimal, which we're going to stay, keep the same. Then we're going to have a column, which is the output column. And this is going to need to be a different type than this. Now, this is going to need to eventually say star decimals or star decimal, whatever it is, uh, star call data dot decimal. Uh, decimals. So <laughs> it's a little annoying because like, it means that we're gonna have to make these two sort of types be a separately templated quantity, so to speak. Uh, which is kind of a pain, definitely kind of a pain. And um, hmm. <clears throat> this actually might be major, major trouble. <laughs> this might be major trouble, you guys. And the, the reason is that I think that the way that this thing works is that this aggregator does random access and sets these. Well, does it? I think what I think what it does is it's it's editing these decibels in place. Yeah, it totally is. So check it out. It goes and looks at the output IDX element of a dot call, and it runs quotient on it, which edits the column. And I think that this might be really problematic for our representation because what. Yeah, red code type slice, we definitely need to do that. But what I'm, I'm also nervous about though, is that like, if we need to edit the middle of the column, which I think we need to do, then we're pretty much out of luck. But maybe we don't need to do that. Output IDX is always increasing. Okay, good then. Glad you're here, you whore. Thank you. Okay, thank God. Okay, no random access. Okay, that really saves us here. <laughs> that really saves us. Whew, I was getting kind of scared. Um, okay, so I guess we're gonna have to go back into template land, make things even more complicated. Truly the dream. So average ag template. Instead of having ret go type, we're gonna have ret go type slice 
And then back in our gen, average ag gen. Um, we're gonna go, oops, red, go type slice will be done like this. And then where we assign red go type, we're going to have something like this here. And I think, I think there's a method that gets us the uh, slice type, isn't there? Need to move that declaration to one line higher. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of uh, the order of the replacer. That's tricky. So presumably, yeah, where do we get the, uh, is it this? I don't think it is. Mm. Something called go type slice, isn't there? Where do we set this to? Go type slice. Do to do, do go type slice name. Go type slice name. Okay, so it's just this function here. Um, Okay, um, so that is basically that. We add a method here, ret go type slice. Whoops. Slice. All right, nice. <clears throat> so then I think what we just need to figure out how to do next is, um, well, we've done that part actually. So that actually might, might be good. I think we're still going to run into trouble, but let's just regenerate uh, for now so that we can see the result. I think the next step is going to be to change the arithmetic. <laughs> the arithmetic is going to have to change for sure because we can't just do this in place anymore. Um, we have to be trickier than that. So let's, let's take a look at this generated code again. Well, let's wait until it gets formatted so that it's not completely disgusting. Um, well, we did something slightly wrong. This should be like this. So that should be easy to fix. Average av, this just has got to be like this over here. Okay. We don't want a slice of slices. That would be confusing. So assuming that that would be fixed though, um, since we can't do this, I guess what we have to do is we have to make a temp decimal like this. Um, reset internal batch so that decimals are reset similar to what bytes has. I don't think I did that yet, but uh, it might have sort of worked automatically because I've embedded bytes into flat decimal. Whoops, not flat decimal, decimal. Um, like if I were to call it's a reset on this thing, right? Yeah, I think I'm fairly sure that this is going to get called automatically because it's embedded inside of the decimal, but we'll see pretty quickly if it like doesn't work at all. Um, oh, I see what you mean, but maybe, hmm. I see there's a special handling. Oh, I see. There's a whole tricky thing. So I guess we'll, ooh, this is going to take some, okay. I'm going to put a to do, well, I suppose we might as well do it now. Um,
Well, I guess all we have to do is actually update this method here. Okay, so over back in our flushing area, what we can do is we can say var d apt.decimal, then we would say d.set int 64 a per count. I mean, technically we want this, we probably want to have like a, a temp variable inside of our ag, right? We would want some sort of temp thing, but we can, we can deal with that later. Um, then we're gonna say, uh, Okay, so what does this do? Quotient. It takes, sets D to the quotient X over Y for Y is not equal to zero. Okay, so we, we basically are gonna say tree dot decimal context dot, there's a de overload helper with the temp decimal. I should definitely check that out. Overload helper. I'll look into that in a bit. Um, so we're going to say decimal context quotient. The result is going to be our D variable, a dot cursum. And then here we have to say a dot call dot get output IDX. And then we get to say, well, if error is equal to, error not equal to nil. Bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you going to do that? By guessing. Thank you for the follow, Tadas. So once we've done the quotient, then we just go ahead and say a dot call dot set, and then presumably, if this is always going up, we should be fine. Should be fine. Okay, so now we just have to templateify this whole thing. You keep thinking it's Patrick from SpongeBob. <laughs> I actually don't really remember. I like went onto some movie quote website to see uh, if they have any movies where they said data bank and they were a bunch of them. So I just took clips of them, but I didn't actually know what the movies were. Um, so here, I guess is where we, uh, paste in this whole business. this, right?
I wish that this part wasn't so slow. I guess I could just be running exec gen on individual files. I probably should do that. Because now I just have like a bunch of issues here. Um, this didn't even make any sense. This needs to say, right? No, this just needs to say D. I didn't, I didn't do this right. <laughs> Not really paying attention. Um, Okay. So the original code said what exactly? Um, it basically said, the original code said, So we're setting the result to this thing, meaning this needs to be D and these things can remain more or less the same, except this one has to say, this one has to say cur. So this is D and this is cur over here. So this is address of D and this is address of cur. Right? I don't even really remember what these like left LM businesses do. Um, oh, this is the wrong, man, this is like the most confusing stuff ever, honestly. I don't even understand. Uh, Accumulate average. All right, here's a sign div. So the only thing that This is actually trouble, right? We have to be passing in a.curidx. We can't be passing in this whole string here. So fortunately, we've got to change this a bit. This has to say output idx. Uh, hey, Melky Dev, uh, thank you so much for the generous raid of 82 people. How are you guys doing? Um, welcome to uh, the stream. Uh, I am Jordan Lewis, large data bank. Um, we're working on CockroachDB, which is a open source distributed database written in Go. Um, we're working on a project to improve the arbitrary precision decimal representation of columns in the database. Um, but uh, yeah, welcome to the stream. We're doing some Go optimization stuff. Feel free to ask questions. Really glad to have you guys here. Um, yeah. What were you guys doing on the stream, Melky? How was your stream? Where is my eggplant? I don't think I have an eggplant, um, but that's a cool idea for my background. I should, I should think about that for next time. <laughs> Slapping eggplants? Um... I don't think I understand what you're talking about there, <laughs> but that sounds pretty exciting. It sounds pretty exciting indeed. Um, we're kind of, to be honest, we are, we're kind of in a bit of a morass of a situation right now. Um, you slapped a few eggplants. I think that kind of feels like there's a inside joke that I'm missing here, not gonna lie. It's literal, you have an eggplant. Okay. It really kind of feels like there's something that I'm just not understanding, but uh, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, feeling excited about that. Okay, so 
we're in a morass, you guys. We're working on this like super templated code that's really difficult to understand. And I apologize for what you're about to see. Um, I think what we need to, oh man. See, it's truly a difficult situation. <laughs> truly a difficult situation. Um, I think what we need to do is make it so that the fourth element of this thing is the column that we're accessing and the zeroth element is the index of the thing that we're accessing. And I think that'll actually probably fix up this whole situation. Uh, complex and confusing situation. Yeah, it is a little bit confusing, but that's okay. You're not really scaring me with the eggplant thing. The truth is I just have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's just kind of the name of the game, I think. So it's all good. It is truly all good. So we're gonna we're gonna rename. We're gonna rename this thing target lm target target. Let's call this target idx, maybe. I think that'll help things out. Target idx. Then this thing's gonna be called target call. How about that? And then we can go like this. Um, just ignore the fact that this is totally horrible. Please don't worry about it. Um, target call, target call. You had a random eggplant sitting on your stream and you never found out why. I have something kind of, sometimes people ask about the horse head in the background of my stream. Do you guys see that? It's pretty weird. It just kind of showed up in my house one day. I'm not really sure why. Yeah, it's an actual, it's like an actual horse head. It's pretty crazy. Um, totally normal. I think, yeah, I think it is probably a message from the mafia. Yeah, it kind of, was it in my bed? Yeah, it was in my bed and I actually just, I sort of moved it out of my bed and onto that doorknob there just to get it. Cause it was kind of gross. It was like bleeding everywhere. It was just like soaking the sheets with the horse, horse blood. So I ended up just moving it onto the door there. So it wasn't bothering me when I was sleeping. But I didn't really think about it too much after that. Um, doesn't seem like too bad of a sign to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's see. So this is gonna be, this first percent S is gonna be what exactly? Man, this is like the most confusing stuff I've seen. First percent S is gonna be. I think it's gonna it's gonna be this left LM, right? <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Okay, let's go look at the diff. Let's let's go ignore that. Ignore the fact that there's a data hand. We don't need to talk about that. Um, the diff has what? So it, what it used to say was the first thing is the, this is what we're setting to, right? This is like the output. So we're, so we're setting, setting the output. Okay. So this is actually irrelevant. I mean, what the heck? I have no idea what we're even trying to go for here, you guys. It's it's deeply confusing to me. Um, okay, basically it's just left LM divided by right LM. That's all there is to it. Okay, so given that, okay, okay, we can do this. We can do this. I, I feel like we're, we're, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get this. Um, so left LM divided by right LM. So X and Y, it's the second and third arguments of this quo thing that we're supposed to be using. So. As a result, this one has to be equal to um, percent or D here. This thing has got to be sent to also address of D. I mean, we're going to set this temporary thing to the result of dividing this number, which is the left LM, um, 
target call. The computer's hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Target IDX. Okay, we're we're figuring it out. We're getting we're getting closer. So left LM, target call, target IDX, D D, and then divide D by cur, and then set the whole result to output IDX again. Okay, I think we did it, guys. I think we did it. I think this is gonna be target call. This is gonna be target IDX. Okay. Holy moly, that was truly horrible. I apologize. I feel like I'm having to really atone for my sins here. Thank you guys for the follows finitely generated and ergo93, really appreciate it. Okay, um, let's go ahead and say make bin exec gen. See if we can generate just that, um, just that code. Mostly my sins. Uh, well, it's our shared sins, right? We're, we're all responsible together for this, these issues. Okay, so um, how do I do this again? I say exec gen path. So if I pass in exec gen hash average aggregate.eg.go, well, something didn't quite work, but uh, that's okay. That just means we probably didn't do something right. Um, um, 153. What the heck? Oh, extra string. Okay, so something one, two, three, four, five. Okay, left LM, target call, target IDX. This one is repeated. Now, to be honest, something is wrong. Let's go look at our diff again. Um, so in this case, in this case, um, the thing that we're dividing by Oh my God, I'm still feeling entirely confused. I'm still feeling entirely confused. The left element is actually cur sum, right? That's what we got. That's what we set here. That's the left LM. Why don't we have right LM? Why have we not? This needs to be something different. This needs to be right LM, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I think something like this, right? Oh man, I'm really eager to figure this out and then be done with it because it's really killing my brain. Um, I have an extra left alum, so, so I do. It should be like this. Okay, set the left. <laughs> I feel so dumb. Okay, set the left to this. Target call, get. This is where we're gonna be writing to, but it's not where we're getting any information from. So this is correct. But how come we're not modifying cur? What the? Yo, I am honestly feeling so dumb right now. I can't even take it. Okay. You see, this thing is very critical. So a dot cur count is actually what we call the same thing as <laughs> uh, 
Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. A dot cur count is what we call. Right LM. Okay. And A dot cur count in this particular case is, um, It's an in64, I see. So no matter what we have to do, I see, I see, I see, I see. So we actually have to have potentially two temp decimals. Um, Okay. So our temp we just we have one temp decimal where we set our cur count. This is going to become our quote unquote right lm. This thing is known as right lm. Right? Um, we get cur. We divide. We we set into the same temp decimal like this. The result of dividing Cur sum, aka left LM, right? And cur sum is a decimal, right? Yeah. Divide left LM by our D, like this. I think this is the the like true, the true representation that we should be aiming for here. I think, <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> hey Beardsley, what's up? The idea of using Twitch chat as a more advanced version of rubber duck debugging. Yeah, it is super advanced, especially when you have people who are paying attention and being extremely helpful. So thank you again for those people. Okay, so um, let's open up the old split window, shall we? Just so we can see if we can try to get this right on the first shot. Well, first try. First try, right? So var d decimal, d set n64 to this thing. This thing is called right lm, right lm, very important. Next we get our output IDX, target call, target IDX, correct? Setting the actual D thing to left LM. So one, two, three. And then we're dividing it by D. The heck? Oh my God. How does one type the stupid thing? Okay, there we go. Um, then we set a.call, aka target call, to target IDX with the result of D. I think this is right. I think this is right. Now a.call.get output IDX is useless. It contains garbage. Oh, yeah. So this cur thing is unnecessary. Right. Um, in which case we can get rid of this. computers hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Thank you for the follow ender. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Will it work? Gamify the paired programming more and give people rewards for finding bugs. Yes. Uh, 
I think that there's no way to give back channel rewards points. So I'm not sure how I'd do it, but it sounds like a good idea. Okay. Um, well, this is taking a long time, which I think means that it works, right? Because, okay, so let's, uh, let's actually go ahead and write this out to our, um, um, copy path. Whoops, well, that didn't work. Package SQL cogsec, um, cogsec ag app hash average ag. Just buy subs for people? <laughs> Could do that. I think that's a good idea, actually. I like that. All right. Well, what's the trouble now? The trouble now is that this needs to be a dress of, I think, right? So there's a couple of other little things. Save up for a quickie world to run. How many channel points do I need to get to get CI text? I need to, yeah, I know we talked about this. Um, CI text, I think we should do it. Um, and yeah, I think that's gonna be work that needs to actually get like, you know, sort of scheduled for realsies and not just like made into a sketchy hack by somebody on a Twitch stream. <laughs> but uh, we'll have to just see about that. So looks like I've got to do something similar for this dot compute thing, but hopefully, okay. Um, well, so sign add needs to be mucked with now, doesn't it? I think a sign add has the same problem. Sign add has exactly the same problem. Um, so to fix a sign add, oh boy, uh, to fix a sign add, we're really gonna be in big trouble, unfortunately, because I don't think that we can merely use this. I think what we need to do is change everything so that it... Okay, so what's the intent here? It's saying we're adding the current sum. We're setting the current sum to the current sum plus the thing at... Oh, actually, this is not so bad. I think what we just need to do is actually change... Um the way that we're getting the element that we're adding. So that shouldn't be terrible, I'm hoping. Really hoping it's not terrible. So write LM. Um, so this thing, right? This this can't be just call of I. This needs to be like execgen.get or something like that. Um, Right. I'm not sure if it'll really work like that though. Uh, did we get rid of that? Oh, it's just because it, it just needs to be like this, right? Doesn't this just like work now on all types? Program a new bot live. Yeah, could do such a thing. Now it's uh, the data bank's too big. I have to narrow down the search. How are you gonna do that? By hey, guessing. Uh hot dads, thank you for the follow. You got more than a pog that time. You got some kind of crazy stuttering sound. So I guess man, this absolutely sucks. I have to say that this is absolutely just awful. Um, because of the, the fact that this thing expects a, this thing expects a point or two decimal. Um, I don't know how to deal with it. Yo, Nikon, thank you so much for hanging out. I will talk to you later.
I think what I'll have to just do is have a special case. I'll have to have a special case. And everybody knows that relational databases don't scale. Hey, Manu Okan, thank you so much joins, for the Prime joins, subscription. Joins and write to disk. Uh, really appreciate your support. Welcome to uh, the stream. Uh, what is up? What is up? I think I'm just going to have to have a special case. I think I'm going to have to have a special case. Um, this project is making me feel like my skills are at most adequate. At the very most, I'm not going to lie. Um, I think what I'll have to say here is, uh, here's what we're going to do. We'll say, uh, val is equal to call dot get, get of I, instead of saying val, we'll call this, um, and then Essentially, what we have to do here is decide whether to pass in alt or uh, You know, I'm actually a little bit confused because I think that even before we really should have had a problem here, right? Um, because before uh, we had literally just this, right? Just a slice of APD decimal. And we never took the pointer of it or anything like that. So how could this have possibly worked before? Um, how did this work at all? You know? Um, hmm. I guess it looks like it took a hard-coded address of. Oh, you know, I think actually, I think actually if we just, it actually might just work if we do this, right? Because it seems like what this does is always take the address of the thing that you pass in, maybe. I don't know. Um. That does seem to work. Okay, sweet. So there's just one little problem left back in our flush method, which is just to say that um, the template should be changed to take the address of this thing. And then I think we should amazingly be good to go. Somehow, I think. It could really be true that we could be good to go. Heard that software could be turned into hardware and back into software? Um, I do still need that variable swarm collective uh, because the reason is that you can't take the address of a method call. You have to store it in a temporary variable first. Unless I got something wrong. But I think I, I, think I need it. Yeah, I definitely need this. Okay. Okay. Holy crap. Okay. Our generated code compiles. That is fantastic. Okay, so let's just let's just rerun make exec gen to rebuild all of the generated code and hopefully hopefully 
we might be at the end of this. I kind of doubt it. We still have to do like, there's some stuff to do, I'm pretty sure. There's like all sorts of other crap that we need to do. So um, basically, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there, but it might just be some. It might just, well, yeah, I think it might just be some. Some template. What does it look like? Um, okay, well, we know how to fix these ones because we just did it. We're getting really close, guys. I think we can. I think we can make this happen. So this needs to be changed to ret go type slice. Some ag gen needs to be changed to have one of these. It's got to have one of these. This has to come up here. Um, this has to have like this. To go type. Um, to, wait, wait, what do we do? Um, av gen slice, go type slice name, go type slice name. Okay. Make one of these. Okay. Very good. Um, then I think we should make a similar change to the template where we do the summing. Yep, just as I thought, we'll have to say elt is equal to call dot get of i. And then we pass in address of elt. Um, elt means element. I'm late for a meeting. Um, that can't be true. That can't be true. Um, the meeting seems undersized. Um, if you type exclamation court point keyboard, you can see more information about that. Um, <laughs> but I'm so close to getting this working end to end, Korean Doctor Strange. I really want to get it working. Out. The data bank's too big. I have Jamie to Alex, down the thank you for the follow. How are you going to do that? By guessing. Now, I think this has to be called dot set like this. Now, I think there's going to be trouble. It's in my about me, that post. Um, it may not be in the commands. Korean Doctor Strange, I'm here to say that I see you, but I'm just ignoring you. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're alienating my chat, Korean Doctor Strange. Oh, it is? Okay, nice. Oh, I just added that one. But is that is that what... Uh... No, see, there's a different post. There's a different post that has my my uh, some other stuff. I should probably make an alias for that one, too. But uh, I don't have it. I don't have it there. If you, It's like somewhere else in my blog. It's called, like, My Desk Setup 2020. Something like, what the heck is this? Um, I don't think that that's actually true, but, uh, I hear, I hear what you're trying to go for there. Um, some ag, um, there you go. Some ag. <laughs> 
Oh man, this is uh, kind of a nightmare, huh? Okay. Well, Computers hooked into over a thousand data banks throughout the world. Okay, I'm gonna try to power through here. I really wanna get this finished. <clears throat> so close, so close. And I think we can do it, I think we can do it. Just have to figure out. Okay. So where's this set in 64 business happening exactly? It's not happening in here. It must be happening in here. Is this thing even coming from though? <laughs> Set in 64. Where is this temp deck coming into over from? Over a thousand again? data banks throughout the world. Overloads hash. Yeah, thanks for the follow, Nomad. Is it this? I don't think so. Oh man, then there's then there's all sorts of other stuff. There's all the selection ops. I think, oh man, hold on. Let me just check to see if those are gonna kind of work. If they're not gonna work, I feel like we might have to end up just calling it for the time being because I just think that there might be a big rabbit hole of stuff still to do. I thought we were getting close, but if it's possible that we're not, then I'm gonna feel a little bit like it's time to stop. But These ones should work. I'm nervous about this set in 64 stuff. Oh, this is all just setting the temp deck. I see. So the trouble is actually, whatever I did here doesn't make any sense. Um. Oh, this doesn't make any sense. Call is actually in 16s. Is that for real? Okay, okay, okay. So I just did something stupid. I just like made my life entirely worse for no reason. Um So um there's a, we could still save it. We could still save it. That's what I'm hearing. This is wrong. Just undo whatever I did with this here. Undo all of this stuff. This is all wrong. This was all fine before and I, until I decided to destroy it for no reason. So you're saying that. Oh, I need to do the uh, bin exec gen hash some ag dot you got go set no because i think isn't that changing uh the uh 
Um, I see. I see, I see. There's two things that are called call. Confusingly, there's two things that are called call. Okay, no big deal. No big deal whatsoever. Um, average sum. Okay. So, dot set. Now, cur ag. So, this is going to need to be decimal. Okay. Oh. Data banks, data banks, data banks. Thanks for the follow light book. <laughs> okay, uh, let's uh, regenerate this one. See what it gets us. Did not change anything. <laughs> um. That's a little bit surprising. Did I not change enough of them? Um, there's two of them to change. And for this, I need to do some temp decimal trickery, right? Um, no, no, this needs to be a, no, 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 no. This just needs to be a dot get something like that. It's not temp, it's actually just, I just need a dot get in here. Um, and this is for add, right? Well. No, maybe you're right. Call of I. I mean, shouldn't I be able to just say call dot get of I? And then didn't did I already try this? I'm confused. This should be this should this should work okay though. I thought. No. Mr. Lunatic, we are working on, why doesn't this work? We're working on, um, um, we are working on changing the representation of arbitrary precision decimals in CockroachDB to be a flat bytes representation. Um, so do we not have set methods on all of these random things? Uh, it's kind of weird. Int 64s, do we have that? Can't remember what we have here. I guess we don't. Execgen.set, right? Yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's uh, regenerate, see what we get. See what we get. Uh-oh. Looks like we didn't interpolate them properly. Some gen. Um. <laughs> No. Okay. Uh, where is the thing that we're supposed to? Mm. 
Replace manipulation funks. This needs to happen. Oh, we have to recompile exec gen for this, I think. No, don't, don't, don't do me like this. Do not do me like this. Uh, um, you think we need this? over here to get the proper thing or whatever. Man, this stuff, <laughs> I forgot how we didn't really finish fixing all this stuff up. Uh, and it is sad. It is truly sad. Well, we don't have it set up in the sum template info thing is the trouble. Man, thank goodness I have you here. Uh, not so, though. Not so. <clears throat> um. <laughs> you know what would be the best thing? is probably to just add dot set methods. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're just going to, in average, we don't need to use dot set for some reason. I don't really know why. We don't have any dot set. We have like some assign add stuff. You know, there's like some other magic that does it. I think what we need to do is add a dot add dot set methods to everything. We're just going to hack it in. We're just going to hack it in. Okay, so we're going to get rid of this execgen.set. We're just going to say a.call dot set output idx a.cur ag. Okay, we're going to go back to basics here because we really should have this anyway. There's no need to do this whole business um, at all. It's not necessary. We should just have these methods. Um, and the fact that we don't, I think, is a little bit silly. Um, so, back over here. Just need to make a method. That's all there is to it. C of IDX equals ag. All right. I mean, honestly, I think that'll probably fix our immediate, our immediate issue. Maybe also for durations. This seems a little bit suspicious, but. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's just rerun. Well, we can just do it with hash. Well, let's just run. <clears throat> what is this spaghetti? <laughs> it's a great question. Stray Katama, you are absolutely right. This is some spaghetti code. Uh, it is, in fact, the template of, uh, <laughs> it's some, it's hard to explain. It's some templated code 
that implements the execution engine of the SQL layer of CockroachDB, <laughs> which is a distributed SQL database. The reason it's templated is that, uh, well, we don't really have a good way to do generic code in Go besides doing some crazy hack stuff. So that's kind of what we're doing. Okay. Um, rewrite in basic. Uh-oh. Um, uh, well, I think we still have a bunch of problems to fix. So I think I'm gonna call it. I think we did a valiant effort and I'm pretty excited about this in general. Um, I just wasn't expecting so many things would have to change exactly, but I'm pretty pumped for the prospect of this because I do think that it's gonna make a bunch of things more efficient um, for decimal computations in Cockroach. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna make a big old commit. Do we have any commits already? We have the encoding. That was a very simple one. This is like the mega one. Uh, <laughs> sure, um, I would, be happy to do that do that uh, so we're gonna add 1 to 52 um, we're gonna add 56 um, and we're gonna say SQL begin to implement flat decimal columns well call it call exec release note um, well, should this be a, this will be an optimistic release note. Well, there's no release note. Um, this commit um, changes the representation of uh, the decimals column in the call exec package to be a wrapped bytes, wrapped flat bytes representation. Um, instead of storing values of apd.decimal in a slice, which contain heap pointers, we now contain, we now store a serialized form of apd.decimal in a flat bytes slice without any heap pointers. Then to access the apd.decimals at runtime, we deserialize them in a zero copy fashion, um, inflating an apd.decimal by pointing its internal, well, it's in, in a close to zero copy fashion by pointing its internal um, varlen um, coefficient field directly at the serialized bytes of the flat. Actually, it's serialized bytes. Okay, well, that's basically a summary. Whew. Okay. Um, seek, uh, so the seek thing was just to get a, I actually have a command for this. If you, if you do, I think it's like git number. I use this little extension for git number, which is pretty nice. And then uh, in order to add files, you can just refer to them by number. And if you wanna do a whole range of files, you can use seek like you do in bash. Um, but I would say, yeah, so Swarm Collective, I would say that um, it's not a very good uh, representation of what Go is like, the thing I was just working on. It, that was pretty pretty deep into this um, sort of template-y stuff that we have to do to deal with generics, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that this is anything like normal Go code. In fact, if this was your normal Go code, you'd kind of be in big trouble. So we definitely have a bit of a 
tricky sort of setup in that area that I was looking at, which is why it's probably difficult to follow. Um, but why don't we go ahead and make a PR for this? Oh, look, look who's in the uh, <laughs> suggested reviewers. It's a big surprise. Um, so I'll add Yahor over here, who's been helpfully contributing in the chat. Um, and kind of want to make this a draft. I'm going to call it SQL add flat decimals representation. And let's just uh, go ahead and copy this whole thing in. Um, the heck? Wait. I'm really, I've never really known a good way to get a commit message into a pull request when it's not the, the only, I always have to do something like this. Okay. Well, okay. So I think that's about that. Uh, you guys can check out the poll if you feel like it. What's up, Tabarelli? I think you caught me right at the end of my stream. I think I'm about to end. Um, but yeah, I think let's, uh, let's go ahead and find someone to raid. Why don't we? But you guys, as always, um, thank you so much for sticking around, hanging out, watching me struggle. Um, I had a lot of fun. I think we got some stuff done. I'm hoping that we can actually make something happen here. I think I'm hoping that it'll be a lot more efficient than what we had before. Um, but if you do follow me on Twitter, I'll probably tweet about this because I try to tweet about the projects that I do after they end on stream so that you can follow along with them as they database, database, trickle database. off of the stream and into reality. So if you follow me on Twitter, it's Twitter. I'm Jordan A. Lewis on Twitter. Um, so that being said, um, now Fortnite Among Us stream win. Uh, Among Us would be cool. I think I tried to do that. It feels a little awkward though. I don't want to like out my friends, you know, it's like kind of weird. So let's find someone to raid here. Who should it be? Um, um, is it going to carry on on Sunday? I don't know, Blind Banana. We'll have to see. I do want to get back to doing a Sunday stream. I haven't done one in a while just because I, I feel like I haven't felt the motivation on the weekends lately, but I'll definitely tweet about it if I do. Um, why, who should we raid? Who should we raid? Okay, let's check out the old, you know what? Why don't we just find who to raid on stream? That should be sort of fun. So how do we do that? We go to, um, yeah, so the other day, I don't know if you guys were around, but I got raided by Jonathan Blow, which was pretty cool. Um, and what Jonathan, whoops, what Jonathan Blow does to find who to stream at the end of his stream, it was this one. what the heck is he, um, just like browses science and technology, like and in front of just... everybody and then pick somebody at random, which is kind of, which is kind of a cool thing. Yo, Sartek, what's up? You just caught me at the very end of my stream. We were just finding someone to raid, but, uh, what he does is he's going to like scroll through and like randomly find someone to raid. So I'm going to try that too. So we can get out of the rate, you know, the rut of rating the same person over and over again. Um, so who do you guys think we should raid? Who do you guys think we should raid? Flarpy Friday. I feel like a lot of people do game dev stuff. Bryant science and tech on stream is literally how you found the stream. That's awesome. That is good to know. Um, oh yeah, when you raided with your college class, that was actually so awesome. That was so fun for me. Virtual 2600 meeting? What do you think that's about? Data banks, data banks, data banks. Um, thank you for the follow, M. Sal. Um, this person doesn't seem to be talking, so I don't want to raid them. I want to raid someone who's talking. Oh, 
Let's raid this random advent of code person. S. Krillin. Okay, let's make it happen. You guys, again, thank you so much uh, for hanging out. Um, I'll see you either next week or sometime earlier if I stream on the weekend. Either way, have a great weekend, you guys, and uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's not... Um...